All right, let's get started. I've been pro procrastinating long enough. Now, yes, I'm prepared. I set it up two days ago, but it's, it's a lot of tabs here and a lot of starts and stops on videos. But I'll just have to have a confidence in myself that the way I set up these tabs is going to make sense because this is not a practiced video. You're going to notice that. I get, it's a little strange because every morning I practice that speech I did that is on, that, that we'll refer to again. And uh, every word is nuanced and practiced now and paused and emphasis and everything else. And uh, <clears throat> this is just, oh, and, uh, you know, compared to that, it just doesn't flow. But we will just have to uh, wing it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, okay, that's enough of looking at me so big, but I just want to say hello in person. And down here, it's kind of, you know, impersonal. I'm still here, but, you know. All right, so let's get started. What is this? What are we doing here? This is UAP physics. Let me quit looking at what you can't see right now and actually look at what we are talking about. Here we are. Here's my... New thumbnail. I'm very happy with it. I hope I can live up to it here. Uh, UAP physics. Light matter interactions in a gravitational field. Light is the medium. And, uh, yeah, I just like this, this old-fashioned looking font. It reminds me of physics books when I was in school a long time ago. And um, this uh, classic... Uh, public domain art um, of the old world. And what have we here? It just re This is flowing over a little bit from last time, which flows over from everything else. So this is a continuation, folks. If this is your first time here, you want to look at the links below and you will see a link called... Uh, called light pumping for an anti-gravity and inertial mass reduction effect. There's a web page. You can read the speech there. It spells out my whole reason to be on here. And there's videos of it with some ad libs and etc. You really have to look at this to know why I'm out here uh, today. And what my continuing argument is. Where are we? We're back on the thumbnail. So, yeah, that's right. After last time, last time I spent quite a bit of time uh, commenting on Professor Kevin Knuth's, um, a couple of his video appearances. And he is, I'm an engineer trying to understand physics enough to engineer a concept or something. I don't know what to call it yet. I don't have the manufacturer's drawings done yet. Just a general concept to get across generally on how to move ahead, whether there's UFOs or not. I don't care, really. I, mean, I, I do, but I don't. But for the purposes of this, not really. Um, because we can do this whether or not some aliens already did it or whatever species lives under the sea or whatnot. So, uh, and I was thinking... Why did I enjoy that so much, commenting on him? It's because he's not a competitor with, with what I'm trying to say here. He's a good foil, but he's not a competitor, so I can bounce off of what he's saying. And his field is not, it is what it is. It's astrophysics, it's outer space and things, you know, things like that, minor detail. So he's not, uh, you know... I'm not criticizing him, which is a game I don't want to get into. But he's useful to contrast and explain without me just talking to myself, in other words. So, that explains this thumbnail, which, what is it? It is, yes, here is an ancient guy who's in the, so roughly the same job as Dr. Kevin Knuth is now, an astrophysicist, back in, you know, I don't know, 1660. 
And uh, you can look up the real story of this drawing if you want. I'm not going to mischaracterize it. But if I recall correctly, this part up here, this is God written in Hebrew, okay? God's up there watching, right? And this angel is trying to explain to this astro by uh, astrophysicist, I think he was the top guy at the time. A, uh, I want to say a Jesuit, but I'm not sure. And this is around the time where Copernicus, who was another guy in the church, probably an ordained priest since he was once nominated for bishop, but that hasn't been proven definitively. But he worked in the church. He was a you know, big shot executive. Let's just call him that. And uh, anyway, as you know, he came up with the idea that the uh, earth goes around the sun, sun, et cetera, and so forth, instead of the other way around. And I think this is the guy that was standing in the way of getting that uh, accepted or acceptable, maybe, to discuss. So I think this angel's trying to straighten this guy out and say, hey, look, Copernicus is right. Look at this. Look at outer space here, you know, and this is a little drawing of it. I think it's, I think it's, I like it. Anyway, so what am I thinking, okay? As you probably know, or some of you do, or most of you do, or all of you will, I hope, in the future, I'm saying to achieve these light speeds and the interstellar stuff, to at least, you know, it's not the be all and end all, but it's a big jump from where we are now. You got to understand, you're not going, f you're going f from the Newtonian pushing off Earth and pushing through air and using force and thrust to <clears throat> a different approach uh, where you reckon, you know, and, well, you're trying to jump from there down to the, the vacuum, the quantum vacuum. You're, those other um, solutions and proposals mostly all involve the interaction with the vacuum, manipulating the Planck lengths of space-time, etc., et uh, which is uh, in magnitude smaller than the whole entire universe is big to us. As I explained last time, well, we'll do it again. We are one meter. The universe is 10 to the 26 zeros behind it meters. That's a trillion, billion, zillion, quadrillion, all that stuff, over and over and over again until you run out of breath. And it's even a trillion, zillion, billion, trillion, billion times smaller than that at negative 35 meters, which is a tiniest, very tiny, a plank length that's called. So I'm saying, while we can probably someday manipulate that Right now, when I look at this angel talking to the, I don't know if, no, that's, I should have got the guy's name. Talking to him, talking to the, uh, he looks like he's wearing a cardinal hat or something. Anyway, I see, there's me there, that little cartoon, that little drawing. That's a drawing, a pencil drawing somebody made. And um, I'm seeing a big gap of light. What is this? What is in all this? What is, that's not what it is, but it's certainly in there. And uh, that reminds me, I made a mistake. Yeah, I keep saying light is what's in space. There's other, it's what's mostly in space, but there is dark matter there. I keep forgetting about it because it's really not, certainly not useful to us right now since people came to find what it is and all that but for now i'll give the physicists a pass temporarily because they say it's 85 percent of what's out there or something yeah anyway i don't care i want to use light to move through light because that's what you're looking at light and you can manipulate it and we as one meter beings can manipulate it. Uh, right, right, right now, we cannot manipulate the plank length. We can't even see, begin to see something that small, let alone touch it, move it, manipulate it, and all that, rip it apart, and all that stuff. And uh, so I'm saying, wake up, 
everybody and see the light, smell the coffee, because that's what you want to work with. And this is our thumbnail. Look, look at all that light and space and all that stuff. And uh, I like that old font because it reminds me of old school books. Anyway, I think we should really open with our open centering prayer and benediction. From my uh, contacts and so on, uh, I, I think although there will be enough information coming out to finally lay to rest that this is not a tinfoil hat subject and there's a reality to it and uh, <clears throat> the government is making a concerted effort to to uh, learn more about it. Um, <clears throat> I think any truly deep state increased knowledge is likely not to come out. I don't see all the barriers falling. Understand. From my In other words, we may surmise, at least I do, that if Deep State figured out, because somebody may or may not have pointed it out to them on Twitter or wherever, that a floating uh, terahertz waveguide floats in terahertz. He knows it, Dr. Puthoff, but he went silent on it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, there are other video videos on that. So, you know, who can blame them? Are they going to come out and tell us? They'd like to. Some of them he might like to. But we, we have to figure this out for ourselves, folks, uh, on the technical side. But I'm not the first one to uh, come up with that reality. But it bears repeating. And uh, this also bears repeating here. This is our fair use jargon. And um, we will be using clips from other shows in a fair use legal way of parody criticism, news reporting, teaching. Parody criticism is allowed for purpose of criticism of news reporting, teaching, parody, which doesn't infringe on copyright under Section 17. United States Code, Section 107. So it's 17 U.S. Anyway, I think they forgot the little section mark. Um, so, yeah, we do that here, and we also do the occasional movie review, where we take a little clip from a movie that you should go out and spend money on. But the movie's so short that you really can't make a copyright claim because nobody is coming to see me because of your little clip, okay? No one's going to suffer through this just to see a little clip of Mickey Mouse or something. But we're not using him. We're not using him. We're not using him. So what have we here? We're just going to follow the uh, follow the tabs and uh, take the occasional break and just go for it. Unprepared. Okay, this was last time. This was last time. And why? This is here for a reason, which I kind of already explained, which has to be explained Yes, it's right in the thumbnail, so we, we don't have to repeat that. Now, we do want to repeat this, though. This is a little short clip from a movie everyone should go and see. It's on, your, it's on every cable channel and streaming anyway, so this has to be our attitude if we're going to do anything other than explode rockets and go 10 feet like Wile E. Coyote. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Your environment is light, buddy boy. Okay, and that goes for everybody else. <clears throat> There's other ways of looking at it, but you cannot overlook that major medium that you live in. It's just, it's, 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 it doesn't compute with me that that hasn't been noticed yet. And by the way, terahertz is temperatures, okay? The universe is full of them. The bottom of terahertz 
is cosmic microwave background radiation, which is coldness to the tune of minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. And the terahertz range is up to the heat, 334 degrees, okay? So, you know, that's what you live in. That's what you can use. That's what space is full of. That's what air is full of. That's what water is full of. That's what other gaseous atmospheres are full of, and even liquid ones, too. So if you can master that, then you're on your way somewhere. So, again, back to the thumbnail. Light is the medium here. So, that's, that's, that's the main point. And, now I remember, um, that's a point that an astrophysicist cannot deny that. Not, not that they would go out of their way to deny it. But I think if you asked any one of them, they might say, you know what, that is the medium, isn't it? Yeah. Sooner or later, my friends. And, um, yes, we entitled this one UAP Physics. To grab a spot on the search engines. Because what's there now is kind of the same old stuff that I don't want to criticize. Instead, I will use the foil. Because of, this is the same old stuff here. Warp drives and, uh, you know, quantum this and that. A worthy, noble goal, but, you know. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. We couldn't have planned this better. You guys look like... What do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. <laughs> they look like a couple of dorks. So, again, go see this movie. Very good. Spend money on it. Dorks. So, again, light is the medium. Here is your universe. That's all temperature. So I put that here. Okay, here's why I put that here. All right. Eric Weinstein. Stein, yes. Got to correct the first time. Eric Weinstein put out a tweet, didn't he? On January 18th. Oh, this is his pinned tweet. That's what it is. So I just saw this recently. And he says in his deep way, chin-stroking way of thoughtful, deep, dark, intellectual webness. Assume a transversible cosmos. Okay. Done. I'll take you up on that, pal. And in fact, I'll answer you. I'll be answer number 683. I'm sure you'll see it. Since I'm a noted physicist, yeah, and mathematician. <laughs> So, my response to him, using my logic and everyday experience and limited knowledge of mathematics and physics, I was an engineer for a while, I'm retired now, but I worked in the nuclear business and stuff like that, so, you know, I'm not a complete dope. And that wouldn't even make me a dope if I didn't do that, I just might be ignorant which is not an insult. I'm unaware. Unaware of these things. All right, so we're going to make that assumption. Okay. So I respond to him and say, next assume the medium of the transversible cosmos at, at, at issue here next assume the medium within is, a, is the physical tangible thing known as light. Look, I'm sitting in it right now. I feel heat. And not, I'm talking over it here on these wires. Fiber optic wires and things. Tangible thing known as light and not some mere mathematical construct known as 
space-time. Or the overused uh, quantum, quantum this, quantum that, quantum, quantum this, quantum, quantum. If it's quantum, then it's quantum. You know you have quantum. So, Mr. Weinstein, assuming that, assuming it's not a mathematical construct, assuming it's something that we have to actually be able to work with, I ask, in my deep, dark, intellectual web way, what is your next move to make the traversing happen? All right, what do you do with it? Assume it's light. You know it is, Weinstein. If you thought about it, what is your next move? Well, I thought I had another one there, too, but I don't. So, oh, we skip, we skip a little bit. We, what, what's your next move? Science as a whole? Scout or soldier? Science needs a scout mindset. Here's why. And we're going to bottom line it here. Because if you follow me on Twitter, you see that I enjoy trashing the science and what a sham it's become. And, you know, the, it's ridiculous for a lot of reasons. That people who are actually in it know better than I do. I'm not going to go there. This is not about that. It's about trying to solve a problem, like traversing, not transversing, traversing the universe. And I'm saying, use light. It is light. It has a lot of light. Why don't we use it? And the scout mindset, where is, it? Where is the bottom line of it? The bottom line of it is, and it, it, it is for life in general, you can... We can disagree about a lot of things, but I'm going to insist that I'm right about this scout mindset, which is a motivation to see things as they are, not as one wishes them to be, and a willingness to revise beliefs in response to new evidence. And I would add to that, not, not change beliefs based on the latest fad. But it's really, without preaching too much, a motivation to see things as they are and not as one wishes them to be. In other words, this, I understand, this light concept, it might be kind of a, a downer from space, time, and ripping fabrics. In the force of 10,000 million suns, Jim. But it's a dull reality. But it, it's going to work. And I think, uh, you know, if you take a realistic view of it, like this guy had to once this angel straightened him out, then you're going to make some real progress. And don't dump that progress until you really find something better. Not just what you wish could be and never will be. Because of natural laws and things like that. And laws of physics. Laws of biology. Science. Either stick with it or shut up about it. So... <clears throat> That leads me back to this thing, which is right here. The reality of the scales that we can, re we can work with. Now, we may, as we wish it to be, we're down here. At, oops, I missed it. We're down there at the plank length. 10 to the minus 35 uh, zeros uh, meters. Where are we? Can we stop? Oh, you got to hit it right, and I'm not hitting it right. Because this is a video, not... This is a GIF, not a video. So, let's just be realistic about it. That's all I ask. And we can use light. 
on some of these these previous well my point here is this is Wayne's new video where he continues with Dr. Lewis Rancourt and etc. Watch what happens when the light... And it's so new, two days ago, that I, I, all I can do is put it on here, link it on here, tell you to go look at it. Because it once again shows how light controls the mass. It also controls the field around the mass. So if your mass is controlling its weight by using mass equivalent light to achieve weightlessness, which is like what a balloon does or an airship, a big heavy thing, that's mass, but it can, it can achieve seemingly weightlessness and overcome gravity when you put the stuff in it that allows it to pass light, which is mass equivalence, through itself. So it's passing enough light through there to lift up all those steel beams and all whatever else it's made out of. I mean, you've all seen pictures of those giant airships of the past that we don't have now, and you've seen a Goodyear blimp, which really doesn't have a dining room in it like these other ones did for uh, transatlantic travel and stuff, and ballrooms with orchestras or whatnot. But that's the way it goes, and um, you know, you, there's no reason. Whoops, there's no reason why that can't be greatly improved upon with, you know, metamaterials, material advances. You don't have to let that gas go randomly uh, around in random order, and you just grab that uh, utility scraps of it, you can create it. But that's been covered in detail on previous videos, so I'm not going to go into the depths of that. But I guess these videos are here to show that um, this isn't going away. Light obviously affects gravity to, a, to an extent where it's um, feasible to work with it. I mean, we saw last time, was that on this one? Yeah, it was on this one that you're looking at. That, um, basically, if you shine, shine here, <sighs> pretend this mouse is a flying, flying, is a flying saucer, whatever. It's pumping enough light through itself to float, just like a blimp does or a vacuum airship, or a solar balloon, or a hot air balloon, or a balloon with a gas in it that works in this atmosphere like hydrogen or helium, that we've seen these things. So, not only is it losing its own weight sufficiently to overcome the force of gravity, we've all seen that. But if it's Twisting the light around itself, which it can easily do. I mean, you know, metamaterials can do this thing. Then it's going to shine more light down here, or maybe more over here, or this side, or on the top. And it's going to have an effect on the gravitational field there. Now, we can argue about what's causing the gravitational field. I say graviton. Some people say waves. I say graviton is a particle made of waves. Where you measure it is the particle. The stuff that flips around the, where you measure it are the waves. It's the same with the photons and things and other particles. And a anyway, if you depending on where you are relative to gravity affecting objects like big planets and things, or maybe there's nothing on that side, you're going to flash more light over here. Maybe you want to fall that way or up, or down. Because as some of the things uh, on that this video from last time that you're looking at, they will show that if you shine light under it, it gets heavier. Why does that happen? Because the gravity's disrupted down there. Because it has a push 
fa factor and a pull factor. Or, and I'm saying this now because I only just thought of it because it's so goofy that it might be right. Maybe the light focuses the gravity even better than it is. It is. It like tightens it up. So, so it's more effective than it is from the entire Earth pulling. Shine that light on it and it tightens it up. Is that how it goes? I don't know, mathematicians are looking for something to do. Well, Sheriff, I got something for you to do. All right. Anyway, where uh, so so that's probably why I put that. I'm look I, here. I am looking for the mouse. It's in my hand. Ah. Uh. So all right. Enough of that yelling and ranting. I guess we're moving on to the part now. Where we don't want to pick on this guy. We're not. He's just doing a lot of media stuff now. And um, we're using him for a foil. This guy being Kevin, Dr. Kevin Knuth, tenured professor of uh, astrophysics, I think. I should look that up someday, get it right. At, uh, at Albany, I think it's uh, SUNY, we used to... He, State University of New York, Albany. I think that's what it is. I know it's in Albany. But uh, anyway, so we have this queued up. This is, and we recommend everybody like, subscribe, and all that stuff with, really, from Tom, with Tom and Dave. And we have it queued up. We're going to get, we have uh, several segments here, but we got to skip here because they had a nice flowing conversation and it jumped around and a lot of it wasn't relevant. It's interesting, of course, yeah, but, and that's not why you're here on this channel for that. Uh, so, where do we start? We start here where we're queued up, supposedly, at nine minutes. And we're going to start talking about things like the Tic Tac and the physics of the Nimitz encounter and things like that similar to last time and then i guess well we'll speed it up the video of course um and we go there for about 11 minutes i guess and then for a few short ones like like five short ones <laughs> and then a joke by dave who was a comedian that's people my age certainly remember and Used to, st used to even stay for a minute to watch the next skit before you go out on Friday night or whenever that was at 11.30. So that took a lot of talent to get someone to do that when there's a cold beer waiting over there. Anyway, where are we? We are at, we, we should be queued up, so. Last time this wasn't that hard, but here we're going to have more skips. I think we just flowed last time. All right, let's give it a shot and see uh, if we're still going here. Yeah, we're going to do, really with Tom and Dave, we're going to do uh, Mr. Powell from SCU on the Chris Leto show. And then we're going to do Kevin Knuth again on the Marwa L. DeWinney show. And uh, that'll be most of the commentary. And then a couple other short little things, comments. It gets a little random. But there's a lot happening. Even though they say there's nothing happening, there's a lot happening. Uh, depends on what strata you're at, I suppose. Pardon me. I get a little dry. I hope you didn't hear that slurping. Matter of fact, I'm going to take another sip. Hold on. That's better. So, so let's get started and see what see what happens here.
quote from your speech was, you know, the unf unfamiliar engineering can look like anomalous physics. Um, but I, I, I want to, you know, if you could talk a little bit, for, for example, there was the, um, you were talking about, I guess, the Nimitz case. And, um, and by the way, yeah, uh, we're going to call it anomalous engineering, maybe, whatever. But yeah, uh, what you're seeing, let's make the point now again. What you're seeing and what you're about to see, I say, can be engineered, can be explained with physics that's been around a while. It's certainly, there's nothing, new, I'm, I don't think I am injecting any new, anything new there. Because there's a lot of uh, information out there about how light moves and how it works and what it is and where it is and what can be done with it. And all that stuff. And that's, I got 25 videos on that stuff. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that every day I spam tons of that stuff. So, yeah. The point being is, I guess, I'm going to make up a point right now. Like, it, like it's really profound when I just thought of it. It could be wrong. I think it's dumb tomorrow. Uh, let me try to be intellectually dark webbish here and stroke my chin a little bit and say we're get, we should be at the point in this conversation where the physics of this stuff and the observables and all that kind of all, you know, agreeing that there's a lot in common there on what we all are seeing and thinking and saying would be required and all this and that. Um, but it's time to start engineering with what we have. That's, I guess that's my point. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry. I interrupted these guys. Let's go back to them and I'll interrupt them again. And some of the characteristics of that, um, of the UAP, the Tic Tac and, and would you, you know, how did you, how did you frame that? What, what kind of, what, what sort of work goes into figuring out what laws are, being broken and or how to apply them to tell us what what we're seeing if that makes sense yeah no right that's that's an interesting case because the um i mean the way i approach it is i really when i started studying this i wanted to find out just how anomalous these things are you know we often hear that it went faster than i've ever seen anything go and we've heard quote, quotes like this over and over again but um you know i wanted to know how, how fast precisely and, and is that reasonable or unreasonable and and what are we really dealing with and so the nimitz case is interesting because the um, so this happened in 2000. This is the thing. We're going to make it reasonable. Reason is going to make it reasonable. It's going to, it's not going to seem anomalous. Once you put two and two together, you can see that it can be done, how it's done, why it's done. Four off the coast of Southern California and off the coast of San Diego and the Nimitz air carrier group was there. Um, and on the USS Princeton, um, senior chief Kevin Day was um, providing, um, you know, radar support for the for the carrier group. And he had been for, um, I think overall for a period of two weeks, been observing objects appearing on his radar at about 80,000 feet, which is very high. I mean, it's twice as high as our, our jet airplanes fly and um, our passenger jets, jets fly. Yeah. And they would uh, drop just down. Just to clarify, to that's, normal, that's normal altitude for seagulls and pelicans, though. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we, no one can help making jokes about the, the seagulls. Yeah, oh boy. He's at it again today, again. Anyway. But yeah, when you talk about dropping from 80,000 feet, yeah. Now, this came up last time. And <clears throat> once you can see how, well, when you, th you can see it, but you got to keep it there. When you see how light can basically disconnect mass from gravity, then a thing like dropping 80,000 feet isn't really anomalous. Uh, and you don't need all this energy and all that stuff. But that, that was last time, but a little repetition never hurt. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Page not a physicist. Don't, don't, you know, <laughs> or a biologist. Yeah. yeah, so these so things would appear at 80,000 feet and they only would drop down to about 28,000 feet which is a more reasonable altitude, but they would then track south at about 100 knots, which is about 120 miles an hour, which is way too slow for um, for something flying at that altitude. For an air yeah, well, 
yeah, it is. It it seems it seems too slow, but it's really speeding up at that point to sixty seven thousand miles an hour to catch up to the Earth. But <clears throat> it's yeah, yeah, it's more like hovering, but but it's not. That's that's not odd to, to go from sixty to drop forty thousand feet and go make a left and just put it in gear and go that way. Plane to fly at that altitude. There's not enough air mm. up there to keep the plane aloft at 120 miles an hour. So these things were already anomalous. And um, yeah, but we don't need air. That was covered last time. And periodically they would drop from 28,000 feet down to sea level in 0.78 seconds. So that's less than a second to drop about five miles um, down to sea level, which which is which is again also shocking. So that was a it's shocking under you know in our current physics and aero uh, engineering uh, aerospace engineering it's called yeah that's anomalous and that's uh, that's a big mystery but not if you do it my way I hate to sound like that but nice it's a it's a nice clean example of um a nice clean description of what these things were doing that allowed you to estimate speeds and accelerations. So um, the mag the um, minimum acceleration that they would have to be able to um, endure to make that maneuver is you'd have to accelerate about halfway and then decelerate to come to a stop just above the sea surface. And if you did the two at the same rate, that gives you the minimum acceleration, which you can then compute is about you know a little over five thousand g's. That's five thousand times the acceleration of gravity, which is which is incredibly anomalous. I mean, that sounds like a lot. That's, that's, that's really hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah. The out but again, covered last time. You put you're putting the energy in and putting it right back immediately, so it's not like a big blast, blast off of Earth and another blast to land like those new uh, SpaceX rockets do, which is cool. It isn't like that. It's more. It's continuous. It's very fast. It's. Uh, I go back to the radiant flux again. These things are moving at light speeds, and if, if, if the surface of your craft, every single point on it, every angstrom, is moving light at a rate approaching the speed of light, that's a lot of mass equivalence. It's going to add up with those numbers I was talking about before, with the zeros upon zeros of time and space. It's energy, den energy density plus time but it's really over time or under time but that's you'll see why i said that in a moment but i'm bad enough outside maximum that our jets can pull is something like nine g's isn't that i think that's about yeah that might be the largest they can pull the the wings and, start ripping off at about 13 and a half g's yeah. so so most equipped but again if that's 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 assuming they're subject to gravity which why would they be and that they're touching air, which why would you touch air in your nice, clean spaceship? It's dirty old earth air. People blowing cigar smoke in there and stuff and vapes and whatnot. Equipment can't handle that, much less the pilots. Um, so um, 5,000 Gs is really anomalous. Mm. And, and the maximum speed would be at the midpoint, which would be about 45,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, that's about the same speed as the New Horizons probe that flew to Pluto. Yeah. So, and within the atmosphere, that should burst into flame, right? Right. And if this is exactly. So if this is happening in the I don't mean to nitpick this guy, and I'm not. What he's saying is entirely correct under our current regime of what we've all learned and what we all use most, you know, day to day. But uh, when he's talking about that speeding up and then slowing down like that, that's it's 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 going to be more instantaneous. It's not really instantaneous, but it's just on and off. Not you're not ramping up and slowing down and for it, yeah, you, you're using time far more efficiently. I guess that's the yeah, you are. That's the point, or one of the points, one of the major points. Atmosphere, you'd expect a fireball. Um, you know, the space shuttle you know, would come in at what seventeen thousand miles an hour, which is for you know only half the speed, and would be on fire. So this is a this is a big. This is again where these things are anomalous, and they're not behaving the way you would expect them to behave. Yeah. Now, but and there are no sonic booms either, which is strange. Yeah. What now, but that, that could, but that could easily be just described as showing unusual flight characteristics. 
wouldn't that just, I mean, is there a point in doing all this calculating and breaking it down when, when the, uh, well, well, the, arrow, the, accelerations, arrow... the accelerations and speeds could, but not having a sonic boom or a fireball is really strange. Um, that yeah. would be hard to imagine. So, so, so you would say that calling it unusual flight characteristics is a bit of an understatement? Uh, it would be an understatement, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What does I that tell get us? That on the record. Yeah. What does that tell and us about? He... Yeah. But you know, he's right though. You know, he... <clears throat> Dave is at least, <sighs> This might sound like a, it's not a criticism. Kevin is talking about the way it is with pretty much known physics. Dave's a little bit imagining outside it when he says that, because he's right. You're just changing the flight characteristics, which sounds easy for me to say, right? Well, that's why you have to look into it a little bit. Nobody ever did it before that I've ever noticed, and I'd probably notice. So that's why. I think that's one thing that people don't generally appreciate about um, UFOs, and you can't, and maybe you can't really appreciate it until you work some of the numbers. But um, these things are really anomalous. I mean, it's surprisingly anomalous, and to the point where it's almost hard to believe that this was actually observed. It's, mm -hmm. it's well, again, you, because in your talk, you also broke down the, the kinds, the amounts of energy that would be required just for that one maneuver, if you could tell, tell yeah, us Yeah, that one maneuver would require the, the, the power that you would require to perform something like this. Um, the maximum power you need is on the order of a terawatt, a thousand, a thousand gigawatts of power. Again, the old way, but we, we discussed it before. Which is well more than 10 times the nuclear power output of the United States. So this yeah. little 40 foot craft is producing more power than all of our nuclear power plants. Um, that's what the data tells us. And that's, that's what the observation suggests. So that's really, again, surprising. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I mean, considerably, <laughs> yeah. to say the least. Um, again, unusual flight characteristics. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Very unusual. <laughs> Yeah, but no. Would that be the, you know, there was some other, you know, there was there was uh, some underwater, um, there were some USOs, some under, you know, uh, which I guess we we say, uh, we call them, what, what are they, you know, underwater submersible objects? or Yeah, underwater. Unidentified submersible objects. Unidentified submersible objects. Submersible yeah. objects. Yeah. Although now UAP covers everything. And yeah, UAP now is technically under, or unidentified aerospace under well, sea phenomena or something like that. Yeah, or, or, yeah. So do you prefer UAP or UFO? I prefer UFOs. Mm -hmm. I want to. We don't. We don't really know what we're all dealing with with UAPs because some of these objects, some of these, some UAPs could be unknown atmospheric phenomena, and mm -hmm. um, some appear to be spoken like a true nuts and bolts craft. And I'm interested in the craft. That's what really yeah. interests me. So I want to know about UFOs. But um, yeah, because that's another I'm trick. Interested in the ones that fly and go underwater. So yeah, another another trick of people who don't want to sort of address underwater being a different part of the atmosphere. That's all. It's the same same thing, but you know, the same principles are used there the phenomenon uh is that is including so much garbage in the in the uh the data that it obscures like if you if you just throw in 95 percent garbage into what you're studying then you can just say well we figured everything out but five percent right, uh, right. but you're but you're kind of stacking the deck with garbage that you know isn't exactly. that five percent is critical that's what you're yeah, really it's the only in. part yeah it's the, the only part that's interesting which i you know but that but that is but that's uh, it seems going back at least at least to the 50s that's that five percent is persisted consistently yeah, exactly yeah from the data you've gathered, and you also study extrasolar planets, so you've studied, in, you know, you under, understand interstellar travel or the requirements. What what does the data tell you about where they're coming from, or or if they're coming from outer space, or uh, what what where do your conclusions lie in terms of this? I mean, or what or what are you starting to feel like is the more likely scenario of what is with us here? No, that's an excellent question, and that's where it gets complicated. Of course, the um, I don't think the situation is that simple. Uh, Carl Sagan once said um, about the hypothesis that these were alien spacecraft, he, he said that he had a hard time believing that you had an alien spacecraft arising, arriving from interstellar space every week. And, um, and, I, and he's absolutely right. That would be hard to believe. Um, and I think that the conclusion is that they're, they're not arriving from interstellar space every week. They live here. They're, they're here. Um, mm -hmm. They have a presence here. And, um, and you can figure that out by paying attention to how long it takes them to react to certain events. So for the... Um, in Japan, when they when the, they had the tsunami, and you had the um, problem, the disaster at the Fukushima rate, um, nuclear generating system, there were UFOs the next day in the area, and mm -hmm. so that means that it would take light a ha information a, ha a half of a day to travel out to wherever they were. They see that there's a problem. Yeah, this is the sort of stuff that I skip. I want to skip over. I I went too far into it. Uh, you know, it's interesting, but it's not the scope of uh, 
of what we're trying to do here that's unique. Um, let's see, where are we? Tw uh, 20, uh, let's see. We're going to go up here to t minute 25 and 17 seconds, which is why these big shot producers have, big shot podcasters have producers that do this for them. All right, we're a little ahead here. Let's try, try it here. Um, what we perceive as space and time is basically the only logically consistent description of events that you could ever come up with. Any description you would come up with would have to have follow all the mathematics of space and time. So it would look like space and time to you. But it mm -hmm. doesn't need to be physical, which is kind of interesting because um, there, there then is no such thing as over there, right? <laughs> it's just to go over yeah. there, you change, how into, you change how you interact with things and now you're over there because you're interacting with things differently. And so- Would that be so an end it, run around the, the cosmic speed limit, um, essentially? It, it, from the work we did, it looked like you still have the speed limit of the speed of light. You still mm -hmm. have a speed limit because all that mathematics comes out of this naturally. So, um, but it's possible that you could um, move very fast. Yeah, he's talking about what he uh, what he does for a living and what his uh, theory of space and time and stuff, which is really interesting. Um, but not dead on point. But he gets fast without actually moving, right? So this is mm -hmm. so this is kind of interesting when you are look, when we're looking at UAPs and we're wondering how they can you know fly through the air at. 45,000 miles an hour or faster and not make fireballs well. Maybe they're not actually moving the way we think they're moving. And then that might not require the same energies that we're calculating, so they might not be as anomalous as we expect. Yes. Um, they're not, they would be anomalous in a different way, right? So, Well, I guess because even within classical physics, there's the notion that the, the space itself can expand faster than light. Yes. Now now he's really made a good point. Or a, uh, well, he didn't make a point. He just It's an observation, but it... It takes us even beyond what I'm saying. In fact, that's true. The yeah. universe, that the universe has at least in it the has past. expanded faster than the speed of light. Well, if it's expanding faster than the speed of light, at some point you're going to grab on and glom on to seize on whatever's doing that or take advantage of it in some other way because I think, I think the some other way becomes clearer the faster you go. Let's put it that way. And I've said before how I think it, it'll go, but. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so it's not a, an alien concept to, to classical right. physics. That's, that's true. Yeah, unless they just make so it. So your physicist after all. <laughs> no, I, no I'm, what on, I'm, you know what, I, what I'm really good up. at is not sounding nearly as confused as I am. No, no, he, t t take, the, uh, take the credit there because it's a good observation. And it's one we're gonna use next once we get this part done. That's, that's my one gift. Whereas my face. Is, I mean, we joke about that. And, you know, and, and that makes sense because, yeah, if they're not coming every other week, all right, I would see. Now you're getting into people's opinions of, opi you know, trying to stay away from that here. I mean, for now. That was, you know, we, we call it, if, it, if we know what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research, so. <laughs> yeah. Know. Well, I think we're that, all trying to things out. I think that, you know, there's a certain, you know, um, like a, a humble aspect to this phenomenon, which I think is necessary, right? To in order to ask the right questions. Um, and I, I mean, for me, maybe it's just because my brain can go there. I mean, I'm, I find it interesting that perhaps if we are sharing some sort of terrestrial, you know, neighbor, is it just this, perhaps this unfamiliar engineering that could conceal them from us as opposed to some kind of more sort of theoretical, uh, I mean, is it? You are correct, sir. Is that on the table? Uh, does they just simply have a technology that masks them from our ability? You know, is a lot of this just a technology that we can't quite conceive of? You can conceive of it, but yeah, you can conceive of it. That's a good question, and I don't. I think there's. That's a good question to keep on the table because I don't know if we don't have answers to to that. So yeah, there are. Yeah, 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 yeah. there's a lot of possibilities, and I think that yeah. too. We can't just rule out all these possibilities until we, you know, get data that does rule them out. So now, as you're juggling all the possibilities in your mind and looking at the data, is there is there one that you go, oh, I hope that's it? Like, is there? Because I know I, have, I mean, I know I have my preferences myself, but is there like, is there a, is there a version of reality that you're hoping it is? And maybe conversely, is there is there one that you're really hoping? Oh, that would be boring. I don't want that to be it, or that's too scary. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's one that I hope for as much as I. Um, I would love to be able to do what they do. Um, the fact that you can move so fast is pretty amazing. And some of these craft are no bigger than my car. I have my yep. new Honda parked out in the garage. And um, yep. 
some of these craft are about that big, and those craft can apparently accelerate at you know thousands of Gs and can reach spacecraft speeds. And get, yeah, you can tell. And maybe go to other planets. So I would love to have a spaceship in my a spacecraft in my garage. That would be amazing. Um, that's what I would. How much do you want it? But that's what I hope for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I know. I have that. My, as I said, my, my preferences. I, I I want at least some of them to be extraterrestrial, just because I want to believe that somehow we can get away from here. Yeah, that would be nice. I I agree with that too. Yeah. You know, if it turns and, out they and are. The fact, the fact that they live here is difficult because it's you know did they evolve here like we did and we're just not aware of them yet or um or did they discover Earth a long time ago and arrive here a long time ago and they've been here throughout human history? I mean, those are two yeah. possibilities. But um, I think both are interesting. But but I like the extraterrestrial idea better I, because that means that means we could go somewhere too. All right, we shut off here again because you know this this stuff's interesting speculation, but it's just you know that's not why you're here. So let's skip ahead. And yeah, I have opinions on all that uh, stuff too. It's fun, fun to think about. So let's skip up to where something interesting is for the purposes of us here today, right now. Because but go ahead. The only thing, I do worry because one person I, like like Avi Loeb, I worry that he'll apply the data. But if but if the data comes back as something that's impossible that he will just assume that it's um, an error in the collection, of the data, that the data is wrong, or that the observation is wrong. Because um, you know, he, he goes on the principle, it, that's, that can't happen, so it didn't. Yeah, see, we're getting into philosophy and opinions and speculation. But what do we do when yeah, the science, his, his when the paper, science comes back? The paper back? that he wrote with Sean Kirkpatrick on fireballs was like that, yeah. Yes. And that, I think that was, that, that he wrote early on when he just first got involved, and I, you know, I hope that, that would turn around a little bit. That, yeah. The data how point, that, how'd that work out? To something else, you follow the data. And, and, yeah, you know, he, he, and he, has a, and he has a good team, he has a good team working with him. I'm, you know, I'm good friends with several of them, and, and they're, they're well. What the hell is going on with that stuff, everybody? By the way, Oumuamua is a light pumper. Let me just say that again. Get that on the record again. No outgassing? Hmm. But it moved like that anyway? How could this be? Better go back and check my videos and tweets and Twitter moments. Where of this team, so it's... Yeah, because I had that even when he was doing the breakdown of the data over uh, the Ukrainian sightings. Where, you know, where he just, yeah, again, I think he was also, that was dealing with fireballs, the things that should be fireballs, but weren't. So he then, so he assumed that the size of the distance had to be wrong. Um, oh, my brain hurts. And what do you do when, you know, what, what does science do when, when the impossible happens? <laughs> that's right. Well, yeah. And science does not handle that well, usually. It's, that's the, one of the first techniques is to, you know, basically deny the data, you know, say that the data has to be wrong. And, right. mm-hmm. and that's, that's a very common response. Where do you, uh, no, it, oh boy. I'm now up to a minute 39. We'll skip ahead again. Uh, fireballs and parachutes, folks. I mean, think of me and how I suffer. As these people, watching people torment themselves with G's and thrust and all that stuff. Well, I don't know. When you throw, when you, when you, t- yeah, I, here's where I'm going. When you tack on parachutes and fireballs onto that, you got to wonder what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm retired. I could be on the golf course, but no, this is too much fun. Let's rejoin them, shall we? All right, I'm hooked up to the internet. Let's see. Did our signal go down? No, I'm hardwired. Catalina, that that he wants to study. What do you know anything about that? Yeah, I do know a little bit about that. We talked about that a bit at Seoul. He was explaining that um, to me at Seoul. Um, the the uh, as we mentioned before, with the undersea aspects, UFOs are associated with water, and um, the Catalina Channel is what what we call a hot spot where there are a lot of sightings and have been a lot of sightings for decades. Um, there's multiple places like this around the world. You have the northern coast of Puerto Rico, um, off the coast of Wales, and um, in the, in those are those are examples. So, so it's not clear. You know, some of these places are where you have very deep water, very close to shore, um, and so so maybe there's a correlation there. You know, maybe 
you know, one of the hypotheses is that these guys have bases way down in the deep ocean that we can't access. Or in- Again, fun to think about and speculate on, but uh, I think the only reason I played that is to uh, just to say one more time, they do the same thing to go through the water as they do to go through the air and space. Not that I've ever seen one, but I do believe that these people are for real saying this stuff. So, uh, for some reason here, we skip off of... Oh, okay, we go to my tweet on water, that's all. Uh, I guess I wanted to say something about that, and we look at this tweet for a second. Oh, yeah, all it does is, it's linked below, it's linked to a video where I say the same stuff about water as I do with air. But here on this tweet, I'm, I guess, uh, yeah. Yes, here we are with a retired at Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet, also out there a lot like Kevin Knuth has been because they, they're still um, <clears throat> going off of the soul conferences they put in all that work on that so they may as well you know uh, write right <clears throat> use it use it elsewhere for newspaper articles and podcasts and things like that so i guess uh Gallaudet wrote an article or it was mentioned in fox news or something here it's linked below whatever this is and of course, I have to chime in and self-promote until I don't have to. And believe me, I'm looking forward to it. Where, uh, yeah, I guess he says, yeah, he says for water as Knuth says for air, which everybody would say, and it's true, you know, it's true given current engineering that uh, in, in place and the physics behind that. But there's other physics out there which hasn't been engineered upon. There's a takeaway for you. Aren't you glad you listened this long? So we're going to do that because there's no reason not to. And it is my goal and job, self-appointed, to get the shaved ape, that's a human being, such as myself, to understand this and do it. Pardon me. So I say here, unexplainable in quotes, I think not. Emoji with sunglasses. That guy needs to get out of his stale echo chamber bubble and into the one that's going to take him places. All right, that's a little over dramatic. All right, I, you know, of course it is. It's social media. You have to overdo it. I don't know that he's in a stale echo chamber. I just know what he said. What he, what you know what he says in public. And uh, for all I know, they already know that I'm right behind closed doors, and he might know but can't say or whatever. I don't know. That's another game. We don't have enough energy to bandwidth to handle that. We mean me. So. That's just my little lame complaint. But then I throw this in as a shot at the military industrial types, whether they're in or out, what they can do and cannot do, do know and maybe not, don't know. Maybe they're faking over here. Maybe it's a psyop, who the, you know. All I know is what I see on TV. This is another good movie you should spend money on. We gave it five zeros here. Here's a little trailer apropos to where we are with these people in their stale echo chamber bubbles. Shall we? Hey, Moran. Have you read what it says in here? You kidding, Tony? You know cops can't read. What does incompetent mean? That mayor, he calls me at two o'clock in the morning. I mean, I don't even answer the phone anymore. Hey, what does baffled mean? <laughs> what does baffled mean? I love that. 
Anyway, I don't know if they're really baffled or not, but if they are, they ought to be looking out, uh, you know, for answers. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. So, uh, then we're going to go back here to Dave and Tom and Kevin for a moment again for, I guess, two more, yeah, two more, two more little snippets of something. Uh, you matter of fact, you know, I might, I might, the. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this one because I thought it was funny, but it isn't. Well, he's right. Well, let's, um, let's give him credit where credit is due, where I almost made a smart comment, just to show a little self-awareness here, okay? It is possible on my part. We're going to go up here to 40, yeah. Very, you know. We think of Earth as being we're, yeah. a land, a landmass, but we're very, we're very land centric. Ocean. Yeah, we're we're terra centric. <laughs> we're terra centric. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Nice. When, uh, well, and there's something interesting. I guess there was the I guess the uh, was it the other day the the uh, the formation that Tim Gallaudet wants to go down and look at uh, got wiped from uh, Google Maps or Google Ocean. Um, really? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. That the uh, yeah the formation hmm. just isn't there anymore. Well, that's um, strange. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know, yeah, I don't know what I think when things like that happen. I've seen things like that happen uh, once on with with the moon as well, with there being something on the moon that you know I was somebody alerted me to and I was looking at, and then um, they updated their data, and then it was at an angle. All right, I missed it somewhere. I, it must have been. It's around there, but anyway, the point is, he makes a joke, and I thought he was wrong, and he wasn't. He's right. Uh, Earth really does then, mean then at dirt. A point I realized... Earth, Earth means dirt. I thought it was just a name that uh, I, thought so it was I always joke that it's, a, it's it's um, after after Uranus, it's the probably the worst named planet in our solar system. Um, <laughs> it should be yeah. called water or Earth, or instead of Earth, it should yeah. be called water or ocean. Yeah. I mean, that's what it should yeah. be called. But yeah. he's, he's right about that. Okay, whatever. I messed that part up a little bit. Because I thought, no, dirt is called Earth because the planet's called Earth, and that's it. But it's really the other way around. If you look at the definition, the entomology of the word Earth, it means it, it means what he said. So he's right there. So, so much for that pointlessness. Let's get to something more uh, funny. Funny and a way to leave these guys alone, and we thank them for allowing them to use their content in a fair use way. Okay, let's go up here to 106.32. Wow, I hit it. Orbiting really close to the stars, so they're hot, um, which makes yeah, them not that's all what like my, That's what my exactly. granddad used to shout. That's what my granddad would shout when he saw a beautiful lady. Hot Jupiter, look at her. <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right. That was funny. That was laugh out loud funny walking around the woods by myself in the middle of nowhere. So let's just leave it on that. Uh, hot Jupiter's uh, note. That's funny. Hot Jupiter's. Look at that lady. Uh, yeah. All right. So we're not ready for him yet. Why is he back on there? Okay. Because I'm lost. That's why. So thank you again dave tom and kevin canoes hot jupiters uh, yeah okay what does baffled mean that's my question for all you uap uh what is that called arrow that's right arrow and the guys that have to move entire flight squadrons or whatever from langley airport because you don't know about a an orb Oh, man. Where have you guys been? You should have liked, shared, and subscribed a long time ago because I'll tell you why they're there. Or not why they're there, but how they're... How a car... How a Honda Civic-sized VW Beetle-looking orange flashy thing that's red and white and... How is it hanging there? Okay? I'm, I'm telling you how. That's how. So... After that little speech. Okay, this, uh, yeah, we're back on the thumbnail because we're going to try to be consistent here. And return to the theme after hot Jupiter jokes. Light is the medium here. I'm here to stress that again. That's why I can make, once you wrap your mind around the f notion, 
that these floating cars over Air Force bases and Tic Tacs and anything, uh, what else was discussed today, are uh, light matter interactions in a gravitational field using light as the medium, using physics we already have, but have not engineered around, have not acknowledged, etc. and so forth. Once you start getting that through your head, you're going to see why a thing can go through the water at 1,500 miles an hour or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. At least uh, think it over. Because it's going to be thought over for you. But the, the people listening to this, the earlier, the more interested they are. And the more you can, I told you so, your friends later. So, let's move on to the Chris Leto show. This week's guest is scientist Robert Powell. You may know him from the SCU and MUFON. He's all over this stuff, folks. You know who he is. They, both of these guys need no introduction. Chris Leto, the retired jet fighter pilot, and um, a podcaster now with, does all kind of interesting stuff about things like UFOs. And he's another one that needs to uh, consider that light is the medium here, which it is. And we can use it to move through it. Step one, metamaterial. Step two, wave guides. Step three, optimize. Step four, building around it. Uh, what's after that? Step five, uh, using it, and then you're gonna get, then you're gonna get moving, then you're gonna get, then you're gonna have to become experts. You think about uh, you know gravity, gra uh, orbital mechanics, except it's gravitational. I guess you could call it mechanics. Because you're moving up and down, you're getting pushed and pulled by the same damn particle, in my opinion. You can call it gravity, you can call it inertia, you can go back, I don't care if you go back to uh, Aristotle, do whatever you want, it's the same thing. And light is going to affect it a certain way, which we have to master. I think we got nailed uh, down the weightlessness part, okay? We know how at least people can grasp that but the wrapping it around and using it to go this way and that way and goofy stuff like falling up that doesn't even make sense falling left falling right falling down anyone can do that hot jupiter so uh, <clears throat> to do that we're going to need an even more and more intuitive sense of how, how you know, you're going to have to reframe your mindsets around that. So where were we? We got to, we're at, uh, we're with uh, Mr. Powell and Leto, and we are going to go, we're all queued up. We're a little early here, four seconds early. And this is about accelerations in G's, apparently. And so to make that determination, I look at acceleration and I give multiple examples in the book. And and I explain how we know what the acceleration was in a given event. So if you think about our current capabilities, right, and even project what are our capabilities 50 years from now, we don't have an object that can remain stationary in the air and then suddenly accelerate linearly at 10 G forces. But well, yeah, 10, not accelerate like that, but we could float better than I think is known. But that goes on to another thing we'll, we'll, we'll address toward the end here. Um, current technology which is being used for spying and whatnot. Maybe why this stuff is hidden, uh, some of it's hidden at least. But yeah, you can hover longer than a stupid four-rotor drone can do. Now, I don't want to argue about it. 
too much. But um, taking off with the 10 G's to the left and right, yeah, that's... Uh, well, we've been, I've been over this, but let's, let's continue. I don't mean to interrupt him too much. Alone, a hundred G-forces. Because usually when we're talking about G-forces and our jets, we're talking about acceleration caused by curvature of the jet as it's moving, not by direct linear acceleration. True and interesting to think about. Sometimes I forget that. Great. I don't even believe any of our, and, and you'll know this for sure because you're an F-16 pilot, but I don't think any of our jets can do two Gs on linear acceleration. Hmm. I believe that the- uh, high, yeah, that'd be a, a very fast acceleration. Um, yeah, right. Two Gs. But, but these objects go from, from sitting still, 10 Gs and beyond. That's because they're detaching themselves from the gravitational field. And then sitting- And they're already weightless. So if you're detached from gravity and you're basically weightless, you're, lo you know, yeah, weightless, you shoot out one or two photons to the left, that's going to have a massive force compared to what it does in our world, even though that is our world. Um, you know, so, yeah, shine a flashlight, you'll take off at 10,000 Gs or something. But... Still again. So, I mean, you have to take like an, an F-35 that w was burning as afterburners, just sitting there for a moment and then suddenly trying to accelerate, right? And he, he might get up to one and a half Gs and, and then to suddenly stop acceleration. And I don't know, he could... Well, when you stop acceleration, you turn gravity back on again. Well, how do you do that, Kelly? Well, here's your flying saucer again. You've got an oval-shaped, I like to think of it as oval-shaped, an oval-shaped, uh, let's say it's, yeah, an oval-shaped bubble going this way to go that way at 10 Gs or whatever it is. However fast you want to get there is how intense you make the bubble. All right? Because it'll disrupt the gravitons, which are, are causing inertia, in that area. So you want to get rid of that. In the alternative, you might, like I said before, which is, this is thinking out loud, that light actually might be focusing it. That would be kind of the subtle, but not malicious trick the old one might have put out there for us to have a few laughs with. But, but anyway, well, so you have this oval, and that now you just move it to the other side. Just flip it this way or this way. It's just light going through air. It's not going to make any noise. It's not going to make any sonic booms. Did you ever hear it? light make any noise? Like, you know. So it's not, you're just, it's just moving the thing. It's just moving, moving the, moving its detachment from the gravitational field. How do you like that? How's that sound? I want to detach over here, but not over there. Up, down, yeah, over there, but not here. So it's not stopping per se. All right. Probably do that for about 30 minutes before he ran out of, out of fuel. Uh, but it doesn't really compare. So that's what I look at is what are the cases in history where we can be reasonably sure that an object has accelerated extreme speeds. And I, I've got many cases of this uh, in the book where this happens. And so that's what I look at to say uh, we have evidence. We're gonna speed this up now, folks. Uh, apparently, apparently we have uh, quite a few minutes of interesting stuff here. I thought it was only, well, let's see. I'm not sure. I can't, my own notes don't make sense completely. So let's go for a little while. We'll speed it up and see if uh, we were supposed to stop or keep going. I don't know why I have that written down there. Yeah, turn it on, turn it off. Okay, let's go and see what's up. Oops. 
going at double speed of an advanced intelligence that has operated in our atmosphere. Yeah, that brings to mind um, the Stephenville case. You know, we, we mentioned that just in the intro there, where you have radar evidence. You know, you have documented evidence of this object moving in ways, like you mentioned, they're accelerating in ways that our jets just can't do. You know, another, I guess, case would be uh, the Nimitz case where we had radar evidence. But um, you were back on Stephenville when you did the, the actual analysis on that. How much do you trust that radar data? You know, could it have been birds of some sort of, you know, unknown or other unknown radar returns? Right. So in the Stephenville case, the reason I trust the radar data is I have uh, visual corroboration of what the radar says is happening. And so this was really the most exciting case probably that I ever personally was involved in. So before I even had the radar data, I went and interviewed in person the individuals that were involved that had seen the object in Stephenville. And my favorite witness was the constable who was at his home and he's outside and he sees this object he estimates two miles behind his home. And at night, all he sees is a light. So he sees this extremely bright light two miles south of his home that's just barely moving around. He runs into his house to get his wife so that she can see what he's looking at. He says, hey, there's a UFO out here. She's like, hey, I'm watching my favorite show. It's my birthday. I'm not going outside. So his nine-year-old son comes outside. So he goes back outside. And he knows that when I'm interviewing him, he knows the exact time he's out there for, for two reasons. Uh, one, he knows when his wife's favorite TV show was on that he was watching. And two, he heard F-16 jets go by before he ever saw the object. So we've got two time markers. So the F-16 jets go by. Later, he sees this bright light. Now, he comes back out within you know, probably a minute. All right. If I remember correctly. Yeah. And, and you know, Chris, I actually... You have to listen to that. That's a very fascinating story. But we're not going to replay 30 or 20-some minutes of, of what the, the story is. We're going to skip ahead to 38 and I think I can give you some substantive uh, meat here let's see if I can that's this is linked below we want to thank these guys never believe that the government hit this information until this all day. right let's slow it down slow it down and make sure we're at the right spot here 38 28 yeah this this should be something interesting for us here. Hmm. And <clears throat> so let me explain when I interviewed these guys, why I knew they were telling the truth. So the first guy I interviewed was Kevin Day. I actually interviewed Kevin Day before anyone had. The media did not even know about Kevin Day when I interviewed him. He wrote a little article after a show I did, kind of like your show, and said, hey, uh, you know, I, I saw what the New York Times was, you know, reporting about. So I sent him a little message and he replied back. So that's how I got a hold of Kevin Day. And I try to keep... Interesting how these, these things uh, all came together, huh? Keep witnesses out of the media because the media can kind of change people's minds as they hear something over and over. But, but at any rate, the important thing was, okay, I interviewed Kevin Day before anyone's talked to him. At the end of the interview, he said, so I'm getting ready to write my report and I go you know, to, to get the data of what happened in the last 24 hours. He was writing his report the next morning after this happened. And he said, all of the tapes were gone. He said, they've been deleted. There was nothing there. And I said, well, how, how often have you ever seen that happen? And, and this guy's had like, he was 15 years in the service at that period of time. He said, I've never seen that happen. I mean, this is a senior chief saying, I've never seen anyone did that happen. So, so the question then becomes, what happened to the data? Yeah. So at that point in time. All right, I was supposed to stop there, but we're, we're going to go back to Aguadilla. I look for. Yeah, I remember the. I was really impressed with the Aguadilla analysis on that case. I heard recently, uh, it was last year, I think, that at some conference, Mick West gave some argument that it could be ballooned somehow. I still cannot understand. Do you know anything about that recent uh, counterpoint that came up? Yeah, yeah, I, I understand his balloon argument. And it, it actually gets pretty technical to explain why that argument's not uh, valid. But it's not that technical, actually. So his, his theory, basically, right, is that as you're in a, an aircraft and you're videoing something, it may look like it's moving faster because of the aircraft itself. Parallax. So, so what we did in Aguadilla case is we eliminated the parallax issue because we said there are three times in the report where we know where this object's located. There's one time where we see it go behind a telephone pole, another time where it goes behind a tree, and then the third time it impacts the water, right? Mm -hmm. So if those are true, then his argument uh, fails right? because yeah. we know exactly where it's at and we know the time so we can calculate the true speed and, and a balloon doesn't answer that. So what he has to do is he has to come up 
with another explanation, right? Yeah. So the first thing he came up with was, okay, it must. Remember that time uh, Mick West was, wouldn't uh, debate this guy? This guy being Robert Powell, I just remember that. Yeah, I wanted to put this in here because, you know, Aguadilla, again, going right in the water, from the air to the water to the air to the uh, parents splitting. I mean, they might have been sharing the same bubble. All right, that's my two cents. If you buy uh, what I'm saying or entertaining it, the thing doesn't split apart. It's just two of them riding together like uh, a Peloton bicycle, bicycles using each other uh, for wind resistance, things like that. I think that's why I had this lined up. So it's, yeah, it's going to cut in the water. It, it, it's it's again, it's it's not interacting with the air, and it's not going to interact directly with the water. It's covered in a bubble that it, it is controlling. Now we, we've never seen anything like that in nature. Who? How do you do that? Yeah, well, you 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 can use your reasoning. You can use known physics. You can use uh, your knowledge of metamaterials and optomechanics and photonics and the like and see that there's 18 different ways to do that. Now, why would you want to do that? Because you want to do what this did. That's why. But nobody's ever done it. But that's why they, it hasn't been done. And nobody understands it when they see it. And I think that's what... It, how it goes, but let's continue. It has to be a tie lantern because that's why it shows up on infrared, right? Because a balloon would not have shown up on infrared unless it was heated. So then, of course, the problem with the tie lanterns was the wind speed was an average of 13 miles an hour with gusts up to 25. Well, for anyone who's tried to light a you know Chinese lantern or tie lantern and let it go up, uh, it's extremely difficult. And once your wind speed gets above about eight miles an hour, the sides of the balloon collapse from the wind. And it's just a little candle sitting there you know, just barely hanging on that heats up the air in the balloon and causes it to rise. But when you've got a lot of wind, you're not going to be able to fly those uh, balloons like that. So there's one problem with it. Then the Talk about tinfoil hats. I mean, some of these debunkers come up with dumber stuff than, you know, well, yeah, it's a paper bag with a candle in it. Yeah, that's it. The next problem he had to come up with is he had to answer, well, so somehow they didn't know where the object was, right? So that I can have my parallax argument. So they, they said, well, we see the object fade sometimes in the video. So that must be what happened, right? That those two times it just happened to fade as it moved behind the telephone pole and it happened to fade as it moved behind the tree, right? And so I've actually taken pics, the pixels that you see in the video. And the other times in the video where you, you always have things fade in and out just slightly, right? But at the times where it disappears, you've got like this, this guy is going to leave no stone unturned. It's many pixels, you know, like a, a histogram distribution, and then suddenly it goes to zero. So they're just gone. Down to the pixel, gone. And then the water becomes a real problem, right? Because it disappears for extended periods of time. So his argument there, and amazingly, Kirkpatrick, I, I think, must listen to Wes because he mimics the same argument without ever thinking about it. He, he says, well, what must have happened is that... He That's your government tax dollars at works, folks. Okay, you got drones causing uh, flights uh, squadrons to move because of this kind of I don't know. How do you spell it? What does incompetence mean? I mean, is this guy a patsy for the next 9/11? This guy being Sean Fitzy, I call him that. Kirkpatrick, I mean, come on, man. You got a get out of jail free card? I bet you Avril does, and Kathleen. Do you have one of these? I don't know. Sure seems like something's wrong there. Either the uh, camera just kind of lost its ability to resolve at that point, or maybe the object's temperature just matched that of its background, so it disappeared, right? <laughs> So, yeah. Yes. Well, it's going again. It uses the ambient light. 
which in this case is a lot of Puerto Rican temperature and some visible light if it was the evening or whatnot. So yeah, well, I guess that was an infrared camera. I don't know if it was visible or not. But yeah, you'll see a ripple in the infrared because it's going in. What is infrared? You know, it's like heat. It's close. We think of it as heat. It's visible light down beyond red where you can't really see it. You can't see it. And then it gets into the heat-ish uh, realm. So you're going to have that on a nice warm, well, warm compared to here any time of year, Puerto Rican night. So the, the problem there, though, is you see the object, it, it's very dark, right? You see, here's what you see in the video. You see this very dark object, which is the heat, the object's generating. And then you see the ocean. And when you see the ocean, you can see the waves as well as the non-waves. So you actually see the heat of the top of the crest of the water as compared to the bottom. So the infrared system is actually accurate enough to measure the difference between the crest and the troughs in the water. And that's because those systems measure down to 0.1 degrees centigrade. As part of researching this, uh, this was fascinating. I learned you can. All right, now I'm going to say something a little snarky. You notice with all these cases that it's, it's always frequencies and radiation and visible eyesight. It's always light with these things. You never hear, well, we saw that the space time fabric was ripped there, you know. Yet when it comes to trying to engineer a solution, a lot of effort is is spent on trying to look at it the hardest possible way, uh, you know, you can. So here we have a thing giving signatures and demonstrating using light to move through light. What more can I say? Let's continue. Actually track submarines with this type of system because the, the crest that the submarine will make as it moves through the water, there's actually a temperature change. And mm -hmm. since these things can measure that much, you can see it. So there's no way this object disappears, right? And you see the different colors of the water, right? You see the dark and the light of the waves. So you can't have a camera that says, oh, I'm going to see the difference in the water. But meanwhile, the object is matching the color of the water and it just disappears. So it's the arguments, it's just like what they do is they just throw out whatever will stick next, you know? And so they- and Kirkpatrick said that. He said yeah. a similar thing about, uh, about the gimbal. He said, yeah, I think it's just a lens artifact. Even though right. I showed, I thought very clearly two separate ways that it, it's actually moving up at, up at altitude at 250 knots. It's yeah. not some distant. I can, distant I'll, I'll bet you money that Kirkpatrick- Again, folks, this Kirkpatrick, man. I don't know if that's the biggest patsy since uh, Lee Harvey. I'm waiting to happen. I, 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 I know I wouldn't sign a thing like that. Patrick got his arguments from Mick West. That, yep. This guy is a PhD in physics, and he can't he can't figure out a better argument than that. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it was also Ryan Graves who was there, said the object was less than ten miles. It was out at seven nautical miles away, which again just refutes all of all of the argument that in the gimbal anyway that it's a long range aircraft. Yeah, because the camera would have at that distance, he would have picked up you know the wing or, or some feature yeah. of that aircraft. Exactly. It seems like did, did you see that a lot? It was a lot of spheres, or did you see any um, boxes inside of a sphere? Have you heard of that? Kind of observation before Ryan Graves said it for the East Coast events. I can't say that that type of object hasn't been seen before because there's literally like two hundred thousand different UFO reports, but wow. it's not a common one. It's not one um, you know that I've heard of before. Yeah, two hundred thousand reports. Um, so what what is your belief in the, in the UFO phenomenon? What what do you think uh, the U, the UFO is? I know you wrote this this book about it, and can you maybe explain it in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what I think there's no doubt in my mind that um, a certain percentage of these UFOs that people have reported, right? The vast bulk of them are things we know that people misinterpret, but a certain percentage of them are real objects that are intelligently controlled by some type of advanced intelligence. Now, what I can't know is where they come from, right? I mean, it could be uh, from another extrasolar planet. It could be another dimension. It could be, you know, some people say time travelers. It could even be something we can't even comprehend, right? That we haven't even thought about yet as to their origin. But independent of the origin, there's no doubt that these objects exist. And as Arrow says, there's no there's no evidence 
no evidence of these objects. Um, do you think we'll have any breakthroughs, I guess, this year, 2024? Um, you know, it, it's hard to say. I, I think Congress will continue to investigate, but I don't think that Arrow is going to do uh, much in terms of investigation. I mean, if, if you look at, uh, I mean, just think about this from the big picture. Kirkpatrick, he spent, the organization only existed 18 months. If he's lucky, he probably spent 15 months actually studying the subject. I've been studying this for 17 years, and, and I can tell you there is no one who's going to study the subject in 12 or 15 months and truly understand it. Um, it's what, what they did is they just touched the surface and he drew a conclusion without a basis behind it, right? Because he doesn't tell us what defines extraterrestrial evidence. What was he looking for to make that case? Yeah, I have to chime in on all that too. Yeah, we get all these criticisms of uh, that report. There, I agree with them. Really, just not methodical, not rigorous, not this, not that. It's, it's he's basically an intelligence operative. He's not a scientist. And to solve this problem, that's a good point. Military actually has been working on this for 75 to 80 years, ever since 1942. And we've gotten nowhere. If we really want to come to a conclusion and try to understand UFOs, it really needs to put be put in the hands of the scientific community and academia, which means Congress needs to apportion a some funding in you know probably several hundred million dollars that would allow academia and scientific groups to apply for grants and do studies on, on the subject because um, you need some very sophisticated equipment to be able to measure these types of accelerations. And you mentioned um, Nimitz and how you investigated that. The accelerations on that, I remember, were, were really interesting. It goes from, I think it was 28,000 feet down to surface level in 0.78 seconds. Uh, right. Dr. Kevin Knuth, he calculated that was up to, I think, 5,000 gravity forces, if I yeah. remember. Yeah. And, and, and you know, Chris, the thing that's interesting about the Nimitz case is there are three instances of high acceleration in that case, all within a four hour period of time. And there has been no UFO case in history that I'm aware of where you have three instances of extreme acceleration. So for your audience to, to kind of think about this, these are three instances of information that we have no craft that can do this. We have no craft that can accelerate, you know, 5,000 G's or even even close. It's, it's a mind Again, same comment about detaching from the gravitational force, etc. Um, I have little to add here, but I'm going to keep going. There might be something. Uh, my notes tell me there might be. Yeah, I mean, because you've most of you have heard all this before. And I recommend you listen to this, of course, because this guy really knows the details. Wow. Boggling, to say the least. So you have that one piece of evidence, right? So that evidence is based on the memory of two individuals, uh, Kevin Day, who was the chief over all of the radar operators, right? So that's what he recalls happening. On, the Aegis, on the Aegis cruiser, right? The Princeton? Right, on the USS Princeton, right, on the Aegis cruiser. And uh, Kevin actually sent me his, uh, I guess you might call it his uh, review by the commanding officer of that ship, the captain. And he his commendation was that he was his primary best senior chief. You know, and that this guy, I mean, it, it was... It was written as if, you know, this guy is great, right? So you've got a guy who at, at that point in time had excellent reviews. And then the other guy, Gary Boris, at that point in time, they know each other today, but back then they didn't. And Gary was in the uh, the command center of the ship, and he has access to that same radar data that, um, you know, is that the radar guys have. So he sees what Kevin Day sees. And when I interviewed Gary Boris, he said the same thing as Kevin Day, but in different terms. I said, how fast did this object move? And he said, how fast did it take you to put that sentence together into your brain? And so he was saying it's, it was just like that. So we have two. Yep, you're dealing with, uh, you know, light scales of time. And your brain is in like what, micro, uh, you know, thousands. I think it's microseconds, MS. Uh, yeah. So it's very slow. Thousands? A light, a light will wrap around an electron in a femtosecond, which is, you know, you're comparing 15 zeros to three. Your brain is three zeros. Light just commonly, you know, interacting without any special engineering. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, orders of magnitude of a three to a 15 bigger. 
So that's why it's so fast. Independent guys. And I, I only harp on that to make the point that uh, you have to think that way to start to... Um, yeah, you have to suspend disbelief of your own senses a lot of the times and say, yeah, it's 15. I never saw a light, a photon go by, but it's 10 to the 15 zeros. I can't, I can see these colors here, but they're in, nine, you know, nine. Well, you know, things are, things go a lot faster than we can, than we can see. And we got, you see, you got to adjust your brain for it. Which, man, that's a whole nother question. How do you drive a thing like that uh, when you're way slower? Ever get in a car? Remember when you first learned, hey, depending on how old you are, learn how to drive a, a car with, uh, you know, manual steering. I don't even know if that exists anymore. could be very tough. My mother had a Volkswagen bus, man, manual steering. That's like, eh. That's like yanking it like this. And you had to yank that thing sometimes. And uh, and then you learn how to drive a... You, get, you go for the first time and drive a car with power steering after that. You go right off the road without a little practice and thought. Same with the brakes. So it's the same... Uh, you, know, pop, uh, you know what I mean. Depending on how old you are. Um... It's just far more sensitive. So you have to adjust. But what if the thing's even more sensitive than your brain is? Uh, I don't know. Gonna have to have a lot of built-in safety. Safety features, like, hell. Yeah. Software updates for cars now, folks. You can see radar data and see an object move at a speed that's beyond anything we can do. So that just, and that's one event of extreme acceleration. Okay, now, move the clock forward about an hour and a half to two hours and you've got four naval graduates in two f-18 jets right and they have been vectored by the uss princeton to a location 50 to 60 miles away by radar so the uss princeton detects the object on radar you have two jets move to that point they look down and they see the objects so now not only do you have radar you have visual confirmation now what's the odds that all this just happens to happen right it it's basically close to zero so these guys look down they see this tic tac Fravor, who's the commander of the whole squadron, he and his backseater head down. He's He has no weapons, but he's flying down towards the Tic Tac because he just wants to see what it is. At the moment he does that, the Tic Tac starts moving up towards him. And then they start doing this circular kind of barrel roll going towards each other. <laughs> now, as Fravor decides, okay, I'm just going to zip across and try to intercept this thing. And at that point, he estimated he was about half a mile, which if you're in a jet, that is, close. as you know, is extremely close. Yeah. So he heads across. At that moment, object tilt slightly and it zips off and as Fravor indicated it was gone in one to two seconds okay now now think about this so what did the other jet now is back up at 20,000 feet watching the event those guys say the same thing slate says well it's just like you shot it out of a gun it was gone so how do you how do you answer that right if you're a skeptic what what, what do you come up with well maybe it was maybe it flew off into the clouds no none of those guys said there were clouds and it was a perfectly clear day well maybe the sun glistened and the object just happened to disappear from view. Well, the problem now is you've got two jets from two different locations, one at 20,000, one at like 8,000 feet. The, the glistening of the sun doesn't blind two different jets simultaneously, no. right? So there's no doubt that's what happened. Cheap debate point here, though. The glistening of the Tic Tac itself might. But that assumes uh, a lot of things anyway. Things that the debunkers don't assume, I do. He shouldn't. His argument's right, but, uh, you know, never mind. <laughs> so then it becomes a trick problem. You know the approximate site is of the object. We gave it a range. Let's say, you know, Fravor and the, and the four pilots thought that's about 30 to 40 feet. But let's say they were wrong. It was only 10 feet in size, right? And so that it could disappear sooner. So we said, well, what if it's only 10 feet? You calculate with trig. We know our eyes can see something down to basically uh, one arc second or one arc minute, which is basically 0 0.01 degrees of space. I was not aware of that. And to give the audience a reference, the moon is 0.5 degrees. So it's about half a degree. 
So we can see something with our eyes down to 50 times smaller than the moon. So you know how far it has to go to disappear from, from our eyes. So that gives you a distance and you know the time, right? One to two seconds. And we said, well, even if, what if it had been five seconds? No matter how you play with the numbers, you get G-forces that are well beyond anything that we can do. So that, that's the second instance. And then the third instance, right, is when you see the video and you see the object suddenly zip off of the video screen. And that was actually the slowest zip. speed that we calculated. And that was around 40 to 50 G-forces. To have three instances of acceleration beyond anything we can do to occur within a four-hour time frame, and each of those is independent, right? We've got two radar guys, we've got four Navy pilots, and we've got a video of three different instances, and all are instances of extreme acceleration. I mean, I can't think of anything that's more convincing uh, than that case. Yeah, and they haven't even mentioned it. You know, the, in the Arrow report, there was nothing about uh, the Nimitz at all. Just no, nothing. The, the Arrow, all the Arrow report says is, well, we couldn't find any information. So, you know, that's and it. If I remember correctly, um, Gary Voorhees also said that they... All right, that's where we came in. And that's where we were supposed to stop, and we came in. All right, so I, um, a lot of that had nothing to do with the nuts and bolts. But it's interesting to listen to again, because these are the kind of things we're going to solve and we're trying to figure out and trying to engineer for ourselves. Uh, using, again, back to the thumbnail, light is the medium here. So that's where we are with him. Okay, so with them, those guys. Thanks, guys. Like, share, subscribe. I'm going to take a short break, which you won't notice, and be back in a second. Let's see. We are going to pause the video. Control pause. See you in a second. Okay, we're back again after a short break so we don't get too used to it because we're going on two hours. That's a long time for me. And uh, I'm starting to feel it. But let's get back into it again. And where are we? We are, again, let's get rid of me so big down here. Continuing with uh, UAP physics, light matter interaction in a gravitational field. That's going to be your answer. Step one is understanding that light is the medium we're going to use for a while at least. And uh, it's inevitable, okay? I'm just, uh, you know, the messenger here. If I, didn't, if I wasn't here doing it, somebody else is going to at some point, somewhere. So, we are continuing, powering through this. <clears throat> and we're going to do a couple of more uh, video, uh, one more video, and then some random, uh, a couple smaller issues of interest to my small, but well ahead of the curve audience. Let's just check one thing here on the software. And we are recording. Wait a minute. We paused. Stopped. Stop. No. no. The clock's not ticking, that's why. Are we unpaused? Let's make sure we're unpaused here. Yeah, because it would say pause, so we're good. All right, let's, let's just keep going. Okay, now the clock's ticking. All right, so we are recording. So let's, that's good. So let's get on here. Now we're going to revisit again poor Kevin Knuth. Subject the commentary from random people out of nowhere. So, well, that's what these shows are for. That's why he goes on them. We thank him. And we thank our host, Marwa L. DeWinney. That's the name of her channel. And this show is linked below. And we suggest you like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And watch Marwa's full video, which is a good one, 
or else it wouldn't be on here. So we have it lined up. We're going to turn it on. Uh, and listen and comment. And uh, let's see, how long are we on here? Oh, okay. We'll find out. I think I knew I'd be a little tired by now, so I didn't... Uh, well, let's see. Sometimes I get my second wind. I totally agree 100% with you. Maybe I want to ask about the... Maybe before going the details about um, the physics of UFO. When you first... I, 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 in 1989, you didn't thought so much about the, the catamatulation and this incident, but when you saw the Tic Tac like videos, that's... I'm just curious at this moment when you saw the video, what kind of like question. I want to touch actually not only from the physics perspective, but also from the spiritual or religious. I'm not sure if you believe in God or you religious. I'm not sure about that, but uh, if you can maybe touch the first phase of... Uh, because I'm asking this question because to, to me it's baffling if there is something smarter than human. We don't know what it is. And it just, uh, to be honest, it makes the belief system, whatever, it's just uh, the, what we, I, I talked to Jack Valley about that, but it just make like our reality is not real and it seems there's something we, we never, we'll never know what it is if it, we are just like um, simulated puppies in, in a new universe or, I don't know, but maybe that's maybe the first part from your spiritual religious perspective for going to science, but what, what actually you thought about when you saw this, like, can you tell me about this experience? Right. I don't, I don't. Now, as a retired lawyer who used to testify for a living, uh, to, as to what I did, it's a different kind of job, anyway. Uh, why did I settle cases for corporations certain ways? Long story. I have to admire her for being able to ask a compound question without using the word and. Very skillful. Uh, I, it, it, beautiful. Okay. I think that the Navy videos influenced me a whole lot. The, and in fact, if you listen to the pilot's testimony or the pilot's descriptions, especially Commander Fravor when he talks about encountering the Tic Tac, what he describes is far more amazing than what they've caught on film. Right, gone on infrared video. Um, in fact, it really does look like the Navy released the three most boring UFO videos that they probably had <laughs> because they're not very exciting. I mean, go fast, you know, go fast is actually not going very fast, um, which perhaps is more interesting. You know, I would, if, 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 the, if the object's not going very fast, then, then comes the question of where does the, where, how is it producing lift? How is it staying up? It's not a seagull, clearly. Um, I'm a lifelong bird watcher. I've seen like 20 species of gull around the world, and that's not a sea. It's ridiculous. Um, plus, it's cold. It's it's a cold. It's an infrared video, and you can tell it's cold, and it's much colder than the sea surface. So what's going on there is very strange. Our machines run hot, and these things very often in these videos are cold. And so there's some interesting physics or engineering going on there already. Well, um, <clears throat> again, yeah, physics or engineering. Yeah, it's uh, it's running on the ambient temperature. Asked and answered. We already know that. But I'll say it again because... Uh, until everybody's saying it, I guess I have to say it again. You know, how does it change your worldview? Well, it changes a, a, lot, a lot, but I mean, it's difficult because we don't really know what these things are yet, and we don't know what the story is yet. So, um, so everything for me is just kind of in flux. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is. Um, it does appear that some of these objects could be non-human technology and very advanced non-human technology. So, yes, certainly there could be someone around that's much smarter than we are, at least in this area, you know, building things, objects like this. Um, but but uh, that doesn't bother me because I never assumed that humans were the smartest things in the universe anyway. I think that that's pretty silly. And I would have hoped that we would have gotten past that with Copernicus when Copernicus, you know, showed us that the Earth was not the center of the universe. And Copernicus and Galileo provided evidence for that in his, you know, finding out that Venus goes through... Man, that's right on point to our uh, our thumbnail, isn't it? Remember, let's go back just for a second. This is unplanned. Like this is really planned. Yeah. There's the angel telling this guy, hey, Copernicus is right. 
Cut him a break. Listen to him. Well, this guy, this this guy looks pretty reasonable. Let's continue. Your phases. So, yeah, man, Jupiter is moons. So we learned there that Earth wasn't the center of the universe. Um, then the idea that humans are is really pretty silly too. We're not. See all the philosophy and stuff. You can't help it. Gets it. It gets mixed in. It gets mixed in with the nuts and bolts. It's uh, when you come at it from this angle. I mean, it's it's interesting. You have to admit it. But, I mean, I mean, look at the evidence. We're not that smart. I mean, we can build things, but we can't get along with each other. We can't figure out how to deal with each other, and um, and especially, you know, when we're fighting, we go we go to war all the time, and it almost never works. It's almost more disastrous, you know, than anything, and um, never really solves the problems. But we but we jump to that solution every time. It, that, that's kind of a measure of stupidity rather than intelligence. So I don't think we're that bright in the first place. So. So that wasn't shattered for me. <laughs> and I can only help. So much cosmic humility everywhere, folks. Weber. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that was, uh, that's uh, an Avi Loeb thing. Cosmic humility. I can only help that, you know, that the peoples who made these craft or objects are much smarter than we are and wiser than we are. That would be kind of nice to have some contact with somebody who at least could give us advice because um, we clearly we need it. Although we probably wouldn't take it. We don't like being told what to do. That's our other problem. I knew you were skeptical and as a physicist, but I, I still didn't get the answer. Like, did you order the code red? Great recross. If she ever wants another career, man, this is a walking, talking litigator on wheels. Which likelihood do you think this, like, the, 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 this craft is like, I'm not sure it's human made or, or alien technology. That's maybe the probability of that. I know it's not wise to say this now as, um, from science perspective, but I'm curious. Also, you did answer me. Do you believe there's a God? I'm not sure if you can answer this question. Did you order? Okay. Because I think it's related. If 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 we think there's something that's smarter than us, that means maybe God is not what we perceive as in relation whatsoever. That's hard. I mean, I, yes, I do believe. Um, that's a yes. What does anybody know about that? I don't think anything. <laughs> I think we know very little. And um, sir, cosmic humility, folks. I mean, we don't act like we do. Um, we don't follow any of the teachings that. Um, were supposedly handed down to us, so we don't even follow them. So how how strongly do any of us really believe if we can't begin to follow the teachings? I mean, time for a bar fight. It's, and so I'm not sure how far that goes, but um, but as to what these objects are, you know, some of the they're UAP are a class of objects. They're all they're unidentified, so they're probably multiple things. I mean, I've seen many pictures of purported UFOs that are were birds. And as a bird watcher, I can spot them really quickly. That's a bird, and his wings are full, and it's diving or in a weird position that, yeah, it makes it look strange, but it's a bird. Um, and usually I can figure out what kind of bird it is, which is, you know, better, or at least the genus, you know, the type of bird. So I've seen pictures of swallows, um, lapwings, which are types of plovers, and um, and gulls are, are the three that I've seen pictures of that people thought were, you know, interesting UFOs. Not that interesting. I've also seen bats, people taking pictures of bats and thinking they were UFOs. And vultures, vultures, yeah. So there's five, five things, you know, that I've been able to identify, but so not, so not all of these things are interesting, right? Um, some of them certainly could be and probably were, you know, um, objects being tested by aerospace companies or a government. Um, so there could be tests or, or, or special programs that not everybody knows about. Um, so certainly that those that's another class of objects that have been spotted. And um, but the ones that are really interesting, the ones that are moving at 40,000 miles an hour through the air without sonic booms, um, these are very strange. And um, I've believe that some of these are non-human craft, advanced craft. And, and the reason for thinking that is the, the physics of these objects is, is far more advanced than anything we could do. And they've been seen for long periods of time. And there are, especially the UFOs that go into water and come out of water, been reported by ship's captains. Um, I've seen reports going back to 1820s, uh, where the ship captain wrote in their log that a disc came out of the, or something like a saucer came out, hovered, came out of the water next to the ship, hovered next to the ship for... All right, we're supposed to keep watching this for quite a little while here. 
Um, so let's do it. A few minutes and then took off into the clouds. Um, 1800s people are reporting these same things. So See, that's, what happens is the stories get mixed in with the, uh, and the narrative gets mixed in with the nuts and bolts stuff, which we're trying to focus on here. But uh, sometimes you just can't unweave it, and I can't cut every other minute. So let's just listen to him and butt in occasionally, even if there's very little to say until we get to the part where there is something to say, because there's no point in just replaying someone else's video. That's, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to comment. Oh, no, they're not Russian or Chinese in the 1800s. I'm over American. There's somebody else. <clears throat> and there's somebody seems to be... Oh, I'm sorry. And, and these, you know, so what are these somebodies like? They, they very probably live on Earth. Um, Carl Sagan had a long time ago said that, and he was, you know, very skeptical of UFOs, and he said that he had a hard time imagining that an interstellar spacecraft was arriving at Earth every other week. And I would have a hard time believing that too. Um, and right there already is a clue that they're not arriving from interstellar space every week. They're in the area already. And you can, you can learn this when you look and see um, when there's a disaster of a sort. So the Fukushima nuclear power plant, when the tidal wave hit and you have have had the radiation leakage it was the next day there were ufos in the area so they got here within a day um which means they're not coming from far away they're coming from earth basically so i think they're here and they think they probably live here um and and when you think about it there the, fa the fact that most um most military sightings at least in the soviet union when they released their reports about 68 percent of the military sightings had to do with water had to do with oceans and deep lakes so they're very probably hanging out in our oceans this has been uh, theme that's come up again and again. And when I've talked to people from our government, that's always the question. What are your capabilities for observing underwater? They always want to know that. Um, in fact, Admiral Gallaudet recently put out a Seoul Foundation white paper where yeah. he talks about underwater UFOs and how they're basically ignored, but are very important. Harder to look down there. And so, I mean, 78% of this planet's surface is water. It's, it is the most poorly named planet in our solar system. This really should be called water instead of Earth or ocean. I mean, that's what it is. Um, and we don't know anything about our oceans. We know very little. We've mapped the surface of Mars far better than we map the surface of Earth, which which says a lot. So we're ignorant about our own planet, and apparently ignorant about who lives here. So it's, it's just, I think is interesting. Yeah, but I'm curious again at this point about well, yeah, the possibility they may be living under the ocean or inside mountain. From the best physics perspective, um, is it? Can you tell me how that possibly could be? Like, like it's adaptation, some different, like different from Homo sapiens or, or something. I'm not sure. But from physics perspective, they, we don't know who they are. So you have a few possibilities still on the table. They either are evolved on Earth like we do, so they're Earthlings like we are, um, or maybe if they live in our oceans, maybe, maybe that's an aquatic species, right, that we don't know. Again, a good question. She comes at it from two different perspectives in one question. I'm sure there's some language and uh, translation involved, but it's still, it's, you know, it's, it just shows how languages reflect different forms of thought? I don't know. About? Um, Good. We, they could be, um, there's a lot of possibilities. They, when people encounter UFOs and, and extraterrestrials, they're often described as humanoids. So, and some of them are described as humans. So are there humans living underwater? You know, you have another possibility where you had, what if there was an earlier human civilization that became advanced and then disappeared, right? And they went into hiding or something or moved or had places to live in the oceans and still do. Um, that's possible. There's, there's a lot of possibilities. I'm, they, and they all seem kind of funny, right? They all seem kind, of, seem kind of improbable and silly, but this is but this is what we're dealing with at this point. Or they could be extraterrestrial, and they could have discovered Earth some time ago and set up bases in the oceans, and um, then that's possible too. So, so we really don't know who they are. And in fact, the U.S. government's language has changed. And we, instead of calling them extraterrestrials or ET, um, we now use the term non-human intelligence or NHI, and that's changed in in our, in our Congress even has changed their terminology. So, we don't know if they're extraterrestrials because they live here um, probably. But, um, but they might originally have been extraterrestrials. So I'm curious about the physics, so that may be the question that struck you when you saw the, the, the history of these cases. Like, what kind of question, from physics perspective, that was, yeah, maybe strange for you, and that big to you to dig deeper? What, what are all the questions? Yeah, the, the speeds and accelerations are shocking. Um, you can't accelerate at 1,000 Gs and not expect there to be trouble. Um, most, most equipment, I mean, people certainly couldn't survive that. We can't survive more than about, you know, 10 to 11 Gs over short periods of time. It's not really G's, it just looks like G's, but we know what you meant. And even our aircraft can't survive accelerations like that. Our new, our new fighter jets, the F-35. Well, again, back to the thumbnail, that's what we're trying to do. And the last, uh, 
video. We're trying to engineer our way around this without offending any existing known physics, which we're not. Makes me wonder what else is out there that's right there. Fighter F-22, the wings get ripped off at about 13 and a half Gs. So yeah, they can't even get up to 20 Gs acceleration. Most missiles can maintain some kind of um, directional control up to about 30 Gs, and their airframes can withstand up to about 50 to 60 Gs, but that's it. Well, it looks like you need a new approach, aerospace industry. You hear that? You need a new approach. This is the new approach. And then, um, so what happens at a thousand, you know, what happens at a thousand Gs is pretty horrible. You've got, um, imagine that half of your... And what did I mean by new approach? Step one, light is the medium here. Already a thousand Gs, so imagine your top half, let's just use round numbers, is a hundred pounds, right? Um, so, so that a hundred pounds is going to feel like a hundred thousand pounds to your lower half. So what's going to happen, what would happen if you put a hundred thousand pounds on you? You're squished, you're a puddle of goo, right? Um, there's no way you can survive it. So, so what's happening when these objects accelerate is a big question. They, it doesn't, they seem to not follow the laws of inertia that we're used to. So it looks like they might be... Yeah, they're detached. Doing something different. Um, they're so detaching. They're using light, which isn't as affected, barely affected, if at all, by gravity and inertia. All we do is glom onto it. One of the ideas is that they are somehow warping space-time around them so that space and time is flat inside the bubble and then you accelerate the bubble. And that is one possible solution. But, but. But yeah, good luck. Plank lengths. Good luck trying to pry through those plank lengths. What's the energy of that? What do you think the vacuum is? Like, uh, you know, foam rubber? Nobody knows for sure what's happening. How possible, well, we, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we don't know. We, we don't know how to, how to do something like that. The amounts, the first calculations show that the amounts of energy needed were really unreasonable, like the mass of the universe and stuff like this. But since then, people have been coming up with other strategies. <clears throat> and worse, you needed what was called negative energy, too, which we don't know how to create negative energy or whether it even can exist in any. We Never heard of it. I can simulate negative mass over time and take a snapshot of it. It's not really negative mass. But it, it, it acts like it. But you have to do something. Or something has to happen. It happens in nature. But if you really, if you want to make it happen for you, you, you got to do something. Reasonable amount of quantity. But now people are coming up ways of putting bubbles inside of bubbles and... Now, is he, is he talking about, did he hear this? About this? I hope so. I hope that's what he's talking about. Because in that case, he would be right. And that has gotten the energy um, requirements down to something more reasonable. But um, You're damn right! But it's still not clear. We wouldn't know how to distill how to make something like this or how to do it. Well, you gotta start somewhere, and you start with a basic idea. Like, light is the medium here, and we use it to reduce drag, friction, and inertial mass. By pumping it through light, in, through, out, and around. Uh, listen to my speeches. Listen to, the, listen to those videos. Link below. It's called A Light Pumping for an Anti-Gravity and Inertial Mass Reduction Effect. Gives you the big picture. You don't need all that energy. You don't need friction. You don't need frickin' fireballs. What else don't you need? I forgot. But you do get to detach from the local gravitational field using homemade items you can find at home in your ambient light that you live in. You couldn't get away from it if you tried. So, we, I would say we do know how to make something, but, you know, that's a very rough outline compared to how it's actually going to be done. But... Knowing what you're doing is usually a good start. All right. But I want to talk again about the, the part about the discovering what is in the ocean or and explaining the thing is about the technology we have, the capturing the data, like the radar and the thing is that when you think about from physics, the technology that we have so far to witness something very advanced, where the trade-off like 
or limitation that maybe when our system like the technology have failed? Would you think then maybe we need to advance a little bit to see, have accurate data or enable us to a little bit understand what, what is actually the ocean? And most? I'm just curious when you think about this bigger question, yeah. Yeah, well, tracking things underwater is really hard because we you can't use any electromagnetic sensing. Electromagnetic fields don't don't propagate far underwater. They get absorbed. So um, so we're pretty much stuck with sonar. Uh, you have to use sonar where you bounce sound waves off of it. Um, so if the object's moving very fast away from you, um, faster than the speed of sound, then you aren't going to be able to hit it with sound waves. So you can't measure it that way. Um, there have been a few cases where they've been detected with sonar. And in one case, I know the object got up to speeds of about 3,000 miles an hour underwater. So it doesn't appear that it appears that you have a situation where, and when, when objects go from air to water, they barely slow down or don't slow down at all, sometimes even speed up. So um, so just like they don't create sonic booms or you have fireballs. Well, yeah, you might, might be able to use that heat like uh, Robert Powell was saying in the last video. But it's going to have to be really sensitive to measure heat way over there. Yeah. I don't know. In the air, it acts like it's not interacting with the air. When they go into water, it almost acts like they're not interacting with the water. They're not. Let it sink in. The bubbles, bubbles aren't necessarily within bubbles, but yeah, you could, you might have different sections of it, you know. Yeah. Some of it's just doing the mass and inertia, and some of it's just doing the protecting. Yeah, you know. It, It'll be a while before um, that's sorted out. But then, then the question comes up as to why would sonar work then? You know, if it's not, if the object is moving through water and not interacting with the water, then sonar shouldn't work. You shouldn't be able to bounce sound waves off of it. So it is interacting. It's just slightly displacing, but not directly. The word I use is slippery. It's slipping through there. It's, it is going through there. There has to be displacement as far as I'm concerned. But it's just pulling, you know, if, here's a, if, there's, a, if there's a water molecule on me, I'm going to pull that light out of it, pump it around, and, and use it as a, as a buffer. Besides, it's not on me in the first place because the buffer's there first. But if you need to reinforce the buffer, there's plenty of radiation in the water. It's just not going very far, like you said. But it's down there because it's in the form of temperature. If it's cold water, it's cold for a reason, because of all those cold photons. Photons are light. They can be absorbed and emitted in, through, out, and around, used for weightlessness and uh, you know, to control the gravitational field of the bubble. Um, what's going on, and I don't think that anybody has an answer at this point. Um, we really don't understand how you can not make sonic booms or fireballs when go going through the air at 40,000 miles an hour, or traveling a few thousand miles under hour underwater and not creating waves or anything. Um, this would be a big problem. So we don't really understand what's happening, and this, this fact, the fact that we don't understand it leads a lot of people to think that the data has to be wrong. This all has to be nonsense because that's not possible, but, but I don't think that all the data is wrong. I think we have a lot of data at this point, a lot of multiple sources of data with eyewitnesses at the same time, it all corroborates, and it just doesn't agree with what we understand. But I think there's a lack in our understanding. Yeah, but those are made to be, uh, you know, gaps are made to be filled or whatever. Glib thing. Yeah, I mean, that'll be the... That uh, baffled that routine is good for now because it's still, you, you know, people are baffled. It's like, I can't... Uh, deny that I have to face reality too just like the scout at attitude or whatever that was and that's the reality but <clears throat> so you see that you put these videos out there and people gradually see it gradually I don't know how gradually it's gonna be but maybe you know who knows the class the uh, stereotypical flying saucer lands on the White House lawn Okay, no more fooling around. Let's get to the bottom of this immediately. Analyze all idiotic theories and see if one comes out perfect. Well, sufficient. And I'm confident this is going to come out very sufficient. <clears throat> one way or the other.
tomorrow, next day, I don't know. Meanwhile, just keep on pushing it. So, <clears throat> we had a... It was supposed to rain today, and I'm all lined up, so today's the day, and I do have my second win back, so... Let's keep on blowing hot air. Maybe I'm curious about this boy when you speculate about this functionality, the feature and intelligence that you saw. Do you think it's about the shape of the craft, like the UFO? And is it the material? What is uh, of the energy when you... I would say yes, yes, and yes. See about the key factors that form the physics like or design engineering when you speculate about that. Good questions. Do you think it's a material that... Yeah. That, that the craft use, or geometry, or the energy they use, what it is. I hope she's on, uh, listens to APEC, altpropulsion.com. If you're listening, Mar, well, you should sign up for that. And participate in the uh, program there. That's all we talk about over there. Well, I think it could be a little of all of them. And also follow me on uh, YouTube. All of the features, because usually when you're engineering, you have to have to, you know, tweak all of those features. So it probably is. I, I don't think there's a single answer as to what's happening, but um, and we certainly don't know what that is at this point. So it's hard to see. That's why I like her. Okay. Uh, she's she's asking the right questions. She's curious about the right things. And she seems to me like the kind of person that's not going to back down. I could see her strenuously objecting. <laughs> Speculate. Um, the, the amount, you can estimate the amounts of energy involved, and in, in all cases, the amounts of energy are phenomena. So the maneuvers that the Tic Tacs were making um, in the 2004 Nimitz encounter require I'll allow it. Aired about um, 1,000 gigawatts of power, which is more than the nuclear power output of the United States. So there's one little craft, you know, 40 feet across long, you know, was producing more power than the entire nuclear power output of the United States. So again, you have to worry, how, how does that happen, right? And, and when it stops moving, um, that energy had to go somewhere. So where did all that energy go? And there should have been an explosion if it just stops. Um, that energy has to go somewhere, but we can't explain that either. So there's a lot we can't explain. And, um, and that's what makes these things really, truly anomalous. So either, so you're left with a situation, either it's really anomalous to the point where we can't explain any aspect of it, or, or we are so wrong in our data collection that the errors are would, are almost unthinkable as well. So, because you have to think how how off would you have to be? How off would you have to be nah, to get this to happen? And, and you're on the right track. Don't sweat it. You're doing good work. You would have to be so far off that you would just claim that radar just doesn't work. Maybe the ability to make sure that the data is accurate. I'm not sure how do you verify that this is not maybe malfunctioning in the radar system. I, I'm just to, how to ensure that. That's a really important question, worrying about how your data is accurate. So one way to handle that is to use multiple instruments, different types of instruments, right? Measure different aspects. And um, so you can use multiple radar systems at the same time. You can um, you can get infrared imagery and visual imagery from multiple angles with multiple cameras. And it's funny, none of these uh, instruments or tales of instruments we hear about, well, they have the radar, they have this, they have that. You never hear anything about, well, it captured gigawatts of uh, heat or radiation or anything. It's just there blending in with the ambient background. That tells me through the principles of detection that they're using the ambient background and putting it right back. Either that or it's magic. Uh, I would explore the first one first. All right, were I in charge? I don't know, who is in charge? Cameras, um, you try to do things like that, and that's what we try to do at UAPX. And I know the other efforts to collect data are also doing similar things, other, other groups like the Galileo Project or um, IFEX in Germany, um, they're all, they're planning on using multiple instruments. So, um, 
And that reduces the possibility of error and makes you more confident in your data. So, uh, but now the trick is to find a UFO and to actually collect that data, and that's hard to do. Yeah, and that's the part I want. Why it's sometimes it's hard to spot it? Now, like it's not that frequent. Maybe that is a question. And of course, from from physics point of view, do you think it could be something? Again, it's just a speculation. It's just natural phenomena or just a non-human intelligence state. I know this is something we can't answer, but when you speculate about the frequency this phenomena happen, do you likely just maybe that's non-human intelligence or maybe natural phenomena that we don't know, like a black hole, the thing that we don't know anything about? Yeah, well, I mean, that certainly of both possibilities of it being, you know, natural phenomena or non-human craft or even human craft, you have all those possibilities. And it's hard to know what the frequency is. We don't know how many, you know, non-human craft are operating on Earth at any time. So it's hard to estimate what the frequency would be. Um, you can get some idea by looking at the frequency of um, of observed objects that haven't been identified. Um, so that, that helps you better get the frequency. But um, it seems like what you really need to do is find a place where they're observed more frequently than than other places. And um, and these are often sites having to do with the oceans. So off the coast of Catalina Island in Southern California, which is where we went and took our measurements, is one place um, off the northern coast of Puerto Rico. There are UFOs are often seen off the coast of Long Island in New York, off the coast of Wales, and there's places in Australia as well. Um, and so probably setting up equipment in a place where UFOs are more commonly seen and just collecting data uh, over a long term, long period would be would be a smart thing to do. And that's what we're trying to trying to do. Yeah, I'm just about to be like, so far data. Um, can you tell me like how it's the data looks like or there's spoiling anything? In the f I'm just, if you can share it about what is going on at UBX now. So, so far we've really gone on one mission and that was to Southern California in, what was it, in 2022, I think it was. Um, all my dates are a blur since COVID. I can't ever get the year right around COVID for some reason. Um, probably not surprising. So that was around, yeah. So we went to Southern California there. That was all documented in A Tear in the Sky, the, the documentary. You can see that on Amazon.com and it's probably elsewhere, free for free at this point. Um, and we recorded mostly infrared video there. Um, we had some visible video, visible camera videos and um, with the UFO DAP system, which is a system that has, has two cameras in it, one with a fisheye lens, which watches the sky. And then it has some machine learning algorithms that are running. So if there's anything interesting, it focuses another camera to look at it and take pictures or take videos. And so we use that. Um, we also use a thing called the Cosmic Watch, which is a made by MIT. It's a particle detector that you use for radiation detection. So we recorded from that too. So that's basically what our data consisted of. Um, if you watch the movie, okay, so here's a few spoilers that you won't get in the movie, so perhaps. So in the movie, the, the team, the first thing that was seen is the team, and there was a team on Catalina Island, and then there was a team on the mainland in Laguna Beach. Most of us were on Laguna Beach. And the, the team in Catalina spotted a bright white light that was um, moving very slowly across the sky and uh, very bright, and they identified that they couldn't identify it was a plane. It wasn't a plane, so they contacted us, and then at one point... Okay, I jumped ahead here because... Uh, maybe he explains a movie, so we, we, we don't need to copy every single thing here. Um, our next question is about glowing orbs. We're more into that than the movie. Although I heard it was a good movie. I, I don't think I saw it. Maybe I can get it on my... I just switched over to streaming. Wow, that's fun. Uh, yeah, but, I, but it is fun. It's better than, uh, I was going to do it eventually anyway, but the cable company here shut off the TV service anyway because they were losing money on it. So, all right, let's get back to business here with the glowing orbs because that's all about uh, UAPX, which is interesting, but that's not what you're listening to me for. I mean, you can hear the real thing. So, glowing orbs. Let's slow it down for her to normal speed and hear the question. Interesting. Maybe I guess about the, the, the global flight, that's um, that would be the uh, situation, the light and the sphere. There is any like the frequent dissipated. Do you think this is has something to do with the, what it is, like the, the globe of the light or the sphere? It doesn't have any ringing in your mind or something maybe? I don't know. Oh, like the like orbs that people see, glowing orbs. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, they're, they're interesting, and it's not clear what they are. They're, they have been studied in Norway. Um, the Hesselton project had been story, studying these things in Norway, and they've recorded spectra, so they appear to be balls of plasma, kind of like what ball lightning would be, right? But um, but not they're not ball lightning. It's different. And um, plasma mixed in with some kind of minerals that are present in the soil. So so it's not clear what's going on. They don't. They're strange because they appear to be balls of plasma, but they um. In some cases, I know here in Pinebush, New York, south of where I am, um, similar things have been observed. Um, I don't think they've taken spectra, anybody's gotten spectra of them, but, but they appear to act intelligently um, and fly around intelligently. So it's another strange type of thing that doesn't appear to be a craft of any kind, um, but is totally different. So is it a natural phenomenon? Possible. Is it um, 
some kind of weird living plasma thing. I have not, I'm just making stuff up now at this point, but that's really what you're left with when you can't explain what it is. Um, you're left with just try to come up with some hypotheses and test them. Thomas Townsend Brown. Thomas Townsend Brown. Do you know him? Oh, Thompson Brown. Oh, I don't know much about his work, actually. Somebody recently pointed me to his work. I don't know much about that. Yeah. Townsend. Actually, I... Man. I want to back her up. Back it up to her question at a normal speed. Where are we? Uh, because we want to hear what she asked him. All right, we're just going to guess. Here it is. Back on normal speed. Thomas Stelves and Brown. Thomas Stelves and Brown. Do you know him? Oh, Thompson Brown. Oh, I don't know much about his work, actually. Somebody recently pointed me to his work. I don't know much about that. Yeah. Actually, I... You would... Thomas Townsend Brown. I get that confused, too, right? He was doing, doing anti-gravity research with electromagnetism, but I don't know much about it, sadly. Well... But you don't have any comments with it. The U, it would be like it doesn't... And also the strange theory that, that at this time to, to, to derail about the real advance of physics. Do you believe in that the string theory was done at this time to also... Not advanced physics, Father. Uh, like That's the Weinstein, uh, Jesse, and Mar Michaels stuff. That string theory was done back then? Is that what you're saying? Or, yeah, no, I... And alien scientist. He's been saying that for years, too. The story of, uh, the split. I don't think that would be true, either. I don't think that's true, either. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe I want to ask you: Do you believe in the abduction stories? That uh, the abduction stories about that you already hear the loss. Do you believe this, this is true? The abduction stories are difficult. The, of course, the, these things are all hard to believe, right? I mean, I don't think anybody believes them easily. Um, the difficulty with the not the difficulty, but the interesting thing about the abduction stories is their consistency. Their consistency over decades and over you know cultures and countries. I mean, you have people in Nepal, in Congo, in the U.S. all reporting the same things. They report the same things happen to them. They report the same types of beings. And they know there's no reason that you should have that kind of consistency. And um, so John Mack, who was a um, Harvard psychologist who had studied the alien abduction phenomena, he started studying them basically thinking, well, this is a really weird psychological problem these people are having. Why do these people all believe this is happening? And he, and he started studying them. And, and, you know, after studying, you know, hundreds of cases around the world, um, came to the conclusion that, you know, he put it really well once. He said you know, something like, um, why, why do people, why do these people all believe they're being abducted? Because it's very simple, because they're being abducted. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and so I think that, you know, when you look at the consistencies across cultures and time, um, it really is compelling. You know, there's, there's some element of truth. Well, I would have skipped this part, but there, according to my notes, there is one more thing on this little section here, and that will be done with Marwa and Kevin for this. But let's see, why did I want to keep this running? There. You know, what that truth is precisely, I think, is yet unknown, but, but um, I think it's important to study that and to try to understand that. Especially because people are claiming, especially because what people are claiming is rather traumatic. I mean, you've got people who are being traumatized. Um, well, we don't want to help these people and figure out what's actually happening to them. Uh, I, I think that would be instead of laughing at them and making fun of them. I think that's that, which is, I mean, you really make fun of somebody who's traumatized. I don't think that's very reasonable, or nice. And what do you think about the Zimbabwe school? Oh, in Zimbabwe, yeah, at the Ariel school. Oh, from what I've seen, it looks it looks entirely consistent with what I've seen in other stories and other accounts. Um, the beings are consistent, the craft are consistent. The you've got consistency in the stories of what sixty kids, sixty five kids, and one teacher who didn't admit to seeing it early on, which is you know too bad. Um, and I've actually talked to um, Salma Siddiq, one of the um, one of the witnesses. She was maybe what fourth or fifth grade, fifth grade, I think, around the time. And I got to talk to her just a few years ago. And there, that's there, that's an amazing encounter, actually. And you've got so many witnesses. There was um, depressions in the graph. I'm definitely interested in these cases, but that's not what this channel's for at this point. That's where it landed. That would take the photos taken of that from the UFO researchers who came shortly after. And um, but we're still on the Thompson Brown section, so maybe something else comes up. There's only a couple more minutes here. And, and there's the, the elements of high strangeness, the, the beings that they encounter in these stories. It always gets very weird. Um, something strange going on. And in fact, here, it's interesting because even the kids say they couldn't tell you precisely where the object was sometimes because it would be here and then it would be over there, but then it would be back again. And, or, um, and the same with the beings. I don't think that they were able to count how many beings there were because they would disappear from a location and appear in another. And one of them, I think, was running in front of the ship and then would, would get to the other side and then reappear here and do it again like he was in a loop. Um, and it, and it can't, you can't help but wonder if, I mean, if, these, if these guys can um, control gravity. Um, gravity is closely related to time, so controlling gravity is basically the same as controlling time. So well, if you have a machine that's... Maybe this is why I let it run, because... All right, let's say you can uh, detach from gravity with light when an object you control, like a spaceship, or something like that, and or whatever it is, 
why would you not make a suit coat out of it or a a uniform just to bop around a little bit you know help you move all right you don't know what the gravity is on planet x or planet earth or any of them so you want to have some consistent experience that's tuned to your body bad enough you're driving a machine that's 15 levels of uh, order or orders of levels ahead of your own brain why do you want to readjust a different gravity at all times so yeah you might bop around a little bit yeah you'd have a suit that just keeps you at some steady steady pace that matches your body that you're used to I don't think that's why I kept that on here. I think I just thought of that and made that up, but uh, I've thought of it before, so why not say it? Messing with gravity is probably also messing with time, too. And so it's... Yeah, I don't know about time, but... It's going to look really weird uh, to us. And uh, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious, about, I'm curious about this one. Appearing a boy and disappearing, and this is where the difference we have made of molecular and particle, which is impossible that we disappear and appear. When you say that... Let's slow her down again. If they are have the same structure as human, like atoms, or it means I'm I'm I'm, I'm I don't want to, I don't understand when you mean controlled gravity. What it looks like, like do you have imagination? Let's say I know from say like imagination how it looks like to control gravity. What like what is the critical thing? Well, if you found this video, you're in the right place because that's what we talk about here. Yeah? We use light to control gravity. Yes, to do that. And some of it could be illusion, too. I mean, you don't know. You're not. Some of these craft have really strong electric fields. We do know that. And electric fields will mess with your brain. So are people perceiving things correctly when these objects are around? That's not clear either. So I think it's, I think it's very, it's, again, very complicated situations. And, um, and there's sadly no easy answers. Um, we're... The, 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 the real take-home message is that these are clearly very strange objects, clearly in need of study. Um, it's nothing to be laughed at or made fun of. It's something that we should actually be on, you know, get on the ball and get studying these things when we can. Yes. I, I would think that's the only thing you can say definitively. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe on to school, what do you think about David Grush and also Bob Lazar, maybe? All right. So she's interested in everything, but we're going to uh, leave her there. Well, according to this, we have three more minutes, though. Maybe the question is relevant. That's first two. What do you think about them? Uh, all right. um, I'll start with Bob Lazar. I, he, it strikes me that... My, my impression is that he probably did have some contact with something, some of the things he describes. I don't believe everything he says because the whole, the whole element 115 business is fishy. Um, it would have been easy back then to just pick an element slightly larger. But I'll say it again. He said the thing got heavier. So he assumed it was creating gravity. But in our last two videos, we again mentioned Rancourt and Newman and the other one, Tattersall. Mm. Um, and of course, Wayne showing these, uh, that these experiments show and logic and reason would dictate that light affects gravity one way or another. <clears throat> and the one, the one experiment showed that if you shine the light under the thing, it got heavier. So what if the thing is shining the light under itself and it, seems to get, and it gets heavier? And it seems to fall forward that way or up or down or left or right, whatever. It's not necessarily creating gravity. That's what Lazar said he, it does. Okay? So it's consistent. Something's consistent. I, you know, of course, I want to see it. Yeah, let's admit that. We all know that. I want to see it. 
So I'm saying the thing is uh, that he thinks is creating gravity is just absorbing ambient light and pushing it down there. So it gets heavier down there. So it falls that way, but it's not creating gravity. It's controlling it. So I guess that's why I'm glad I stuck with this. We got three minutes. Larger than the elements that are known um, because it would seem possible. But the problem with element 115 is there's no stable isotopes. So you can't have a sample of element 115. Yeah, we don't need it anyway, but... So then he claimed, you know, somebody called him on that, and then he claims that, well, it was stable when it was in their machine. Well, if it's stable when it's in their machine, then how did you measure it? How did you get it out to measure it to tell that it was 115? You're going to have to how many, how many, how many? put it through a mass spectrometer, which means you're going to have to take it out of their machine, put it through a mass spectrometer. Yeah, that's a ticket. In which case the isotope is going to be, um, they're all unstable. And if it wasn't unstable, then you should know what the isotope is because it won't just be 115, it'll be whatever the actual isotope was. So um, so they should have yes. known what the mass was if they measured it. Um, but that was and but that was never um, he basically walks as a physicist, what it appears, he walks a very narrow line of giving you enough information to make it sound like it could be real but not too much information to be able to prove that it's wrong. Yeah. Good logic there. Philosophy, I meant. That's, he, he really, I'm talking about Bob Lazar, so he really walks that line. And so, so I find that, I find what he's saying, you know, I don't believe everything that he says, but I don't think it's total nonsense. So, it, all right, it has element of truth to it. I think there's an element of truth, but I don't know what that truth is, so it's difficult. What is truth, isn't it? Oh, uh, when it comes to David Grush, when it. All right, I think we're supposed to cut off here. But let's see what the question is. Are the comes to David Grush? I believe that he saw and learned about. Um, the programs that he talked about. I think he is telling the truth. Um, it would be silly for him not to. Cons yeah, and that, then we're getting into the uh, legal aspects of what is a whistleblower and all that stuff. So that'll play out elsewhere. Uh, not on this video, but I can't wait to see what he comes up with. What are the results? What nuts and bolts are they sitting on? Come on, Wright Patterson. Terahertz wave guides. Give me a break. You're busted, folks. All right. So we're done with Marwa, and we thank Marwa and Kevin again. Wow, she got a lot of views on that. And a lot more subscribers than she had before, so good for her. Well, a lot of views. I don't know. She might have had that many subscribers. I don't know. But... I guess I saw it when it first came out. So, let's see. Where are we? Oh, okay. So, we're now we're going back to the tab. So, we're going to free Lancet. We're going to add live ourselves out of here. But it's we have there's a lot to talk about there. So, again, everybody light is the medium. We're controlling gravity with light matter interactions, absorbing, emitting, in, through, out, and around. That's your basic thing to get into your head. It's going to give you weightlessness. There's no argument there. I mean, everyone should know that. Okay, just, just take it in and own it. But the weightlessness you see is not optimal weightlessness. It's just the uh, semi, semi weightlessness. That's a better way of putting it. So we're going to improve upon it and optimize it. And then we're going to wrap a little bubble around it. Okay, if we can control light, we can do that, right? Easy. Once we want to, once we realize how good it is. 
That gets rid of your fireballs. That gets rid of your splashes. That gets rid of your drag friction and inertial mass. That gets rid of stuff. We can do that if we put our mind to it. And then when you throw that field out even further, it's going to control the gravity around you. That's not quite as fully understood as yet as the other stuff that no one will argue about. And as far as controlling the field around you, which I'll say it's indisputable. I'll start an argument if I have to. It's indisputable. That happens. Wayne shows it on his videos all the time. It's been written up by those scientists I previously mentioned and previously have in previous videos. And, uh, you know, we can foot drag on it if you want. It can keep calculating uh, gigawatts and stuff forever and being baffled. How long you want to do that? That's your call. So, uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, that's our bottom line. When you get that simple, that's easy to remember, just controlling light, light matter interaction. Then you're going to control your gravitational field. Now, the actual engineering of it, that's the concept. All right, I used to work in design engineering. And you would have the design concept, then you have the deliverables and the packages and all that stuff underneath it and the vendors over here and what you need over there and the constructability reviews here. There's a whole process for that. That's the same process as this is going to be. And um, so you're going to have to go through it. I'm giving you the big picture right now, the design concept. And then you wrap it up in a package and all that. But to do that, first you have to get the concept through your head. Okay, I guess that's where we're at right now. So that's why I repeat myself a lot. And that's what it takes, right? You think people are going to believe that this wheel is going to roll? Or you, you can capture fire and do stuff with it? Or the motive power of heat is real? Everything runs on it now. That was, that was voodoo, practically, back just a few hundred years ago. I don't know how you pronounce it. Mr. Carno, he's been it discussed before. Sadie, I don't know if it's... S-A-D-I, how do you pronounce that in French? <clears throat> A man's name, Sadie Carno. You know, they thought it was wee beasties and stuff that caused fire to have force, ooh, you yeah. know. This is just a, the beginning of that stage, of uh, that guy's crazy stage. Or he's right and just ahead of his time, whatever. So, take a look, look later at what, at stuff. Now we're on just stuff here. Couple of minutes of stuff. Couple of minutes of stuff here. Just general commentary on stuff that's, I guess, happening right now. And we end with that. And where's our where are we? Okay, let's quickly hit this stuff. Some of it we might skip because, all right, this is just a this is another fresh video. Oh no, this one isn't. Well, it's fairly fresh. One month ago, I don't think I've mentioned it in any other video yet. I'm pretty sure I did not. Buoyancy versus anti-gravity. No atmosphere required. And this was by Wayne Ojala from Fail Forward Research. Linked right here on the page. And some of you know him from APEC. And you're going to have to look at this yourself. Draw your own conclusions. It basically shows and agrees with and confirms and all that stuff what I've been saying. So that's why it's here, to further prove me right. And also to show that it can be demonstrated by you. Other people believe this in general. I just happen to have it wrapped up in a package, probably more comprehensively than anyone else. Uh, but in other words, don't take my word for it. 
Okay, go look at this stuff. That's a 10-minute video describing what he did to show. Well, some people confuse that this is a good uh, thumbnail he's got here, buoyancy. They're saying, well, you know, it's not light pumping, it's, it's buoyancy. No, I mean, it's easy to confuse. I was stuck there for a long, long time. Is the light pumping causing density, causing buoyancy, causing this? Which, no, it's because that, if last, you know, no, in the end, there are root causes, and there's a hierarchy of what's what. That's the way it is. That's our scout attitude, and that's what pushes us. Uh, you know, you, you feel like you want to dismiss this offhand, what I'm saying. Go ahead, feel free. Or you can stop being lazy and just parroting what you learned in third grade and then relearned again in, I don't care, physics level PhDs or a PhD level physics because you're not, you're not seeing, you're not using what your cohorts have developed. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is. I didn't, uh, I don't get any credit for that except for telling you. And I, this is here because somebody just sent me a link yesterday. No, no, an email. Somebody went to the trouble to find my email to send this, which is a further, which is a paper. It's actually a small book by the uh, Lewis Joseph Rancourt, who inspires Wayne. And I discussed before and inspires people on Twitter. And he's not well known, but he's been at this same thing. Not quite the same way that I'm doing it. Well, you can read it yourself and decide what, you, what you're saying, what you, <clears throat> what you think. And he's looking at light. He's like me in a way. He's fascinated by it. Okay, I might have even read this back 10 years ago when I first started getting into it. I don't know why I wouldn't have. Oh, except it wasn't written then. Uh, well, was it? Anyway, I suggest that everybody look at this. If you think I might be right, but uh, I'm not answering something that is a concern of yours, have a look at this. He's talking about, you know, he covers a lot of things that I just skip over because I already dismissed them. But if you want to look at some of these things in more detail, I mean, I have my web page and my secret web page that goes step by step by how I came up with it. But his is, um, I would say, more organized right here, like I said, in a book form. I went, <clears throat> I was going to buy the book on Amazon, but it's not there. So you have to print it out in, in uh, full text, uh, PDF. Anyway, that's a mention, that's a mention. Um... Let's just play Wayne's thing a little bit. So, I mean, this should not be happening if buoyancy is an explanation. The really important thing to note here is that the weight returns when I remove the heat lamp. So, in other words, as the water vapor inside the jug cools down by radiation, uh, its weight goes back to uh, where it was. So, here I'm just uh, now letting the air back into the chamber, and you're going to see the jug collapse under atmospheric pressure. He's step by step. He's got. Um Production values on his videos, it's all laid out logically. It's not just me ranting. He takes his time on this stuff. He tells you what he's trying to demonstrate and then does it. Plus he's got music going. So it's pumped down to minus 30 inches of mercury in here. And that's just a little glass uh, food jar with the lid on very tightly. And it's a little bit of uh, charcoal, ground charcoal briquettes in there, and uh, some, a little bit of water. So this is the laser dot here uh, coming from outside, and then reflecting off a little mirror down there onto this piece of paper. Just as a, it makes the balance more sensitive to uh, very very small movements. So what I'm gonna do is shine this this light on the jar inside there, and see if it changes the weight here, makes it lighter, and then if it comes back a little while later. So this should uh, rule out any. Um, that rule of buoyancy completely as a cause. Now, if you're patient enough to watch this clip, you'll see the, the red dot slowly move to the left. 
indicating a small loss in weight. Now the reason I think with the glass jar is what I found is the reason why um, it seems like it doesn't go back to baseline or doesn't go regain its weight is because glass jars act like little greenhouses and they uh, you can shine the visible light into them and warm up whatever's inside but when whatever's inside gets warm and it radiates re-radiates infrared energy um, that can't escape through the glass so the process of cooling or shedding its internal energy is far slower than through the plastic jug um, which is made of high density polyethylene any milk jug for example uh, this material has this property of being able to as you can see this is not Argonne lab, this is not, uh, you know, Ames laboratory or CERN. It's a guy at home, basically, showing all this stuff. And, um, it just shows you the curiosity is out there. And, uh, I'm not alone on this, which is nice. Transmit far infrared really well, whereas glass acts like a mirror. And so Plus, it answers a bunch of questions. I mean, I kind of already know all this stuff uh, because I had to go through these hoops myself. And um, he's just doing it step by step and showing people. So if you're at all interested in this, check it out. All right, so we, uh, we looked at Rancourt's book. Uh, this was last time we recommended this movie. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is where I'm going to demonstrate a little self-awareness, okay? Now, in one of my last videos, I made fun of people that say, gravity, what is it? Mass tells space how to bend, and space tells mass how to move, okay? It's very clever, it's cute, but we've all heard it over and over again. As far as I'm concerned, it's a mindset that we have to move beyond. It's true, it's correct, but it's not going to solve the problem of anti-gravity. All it's going to do is tell you what the problem is over and over and over again. So I get a little tired of hearing it. So I made fun of it last time. And I intentionally cut it out early. Because when I watched this film, and this guy in a film you should buy, recommend, spend money on, two thumbs up, Five stars. It's about this guy. Well, it's this guy, Alan Alda, plays a blowhard, you know. He's really successful, and uh, the protagonist is his brother-in-law, and he's got to put up with this blowhard. And why is this guy so lucky? Everything he touches turns to gold and all that. You know the type. Everybody's got jealousies, okay? That's what this is. So this is the blowhard. Let's listen, shall we? Remember, space tells bend how to bend, and... If, it's, if it bends, it's funny. If it breaks, it's not funny. So you gotta get back from the pain, you see what I mean? But the point is, the guy repeats himself like a blowhard and says that in every interview. He's a famous guy, by the way. He makes movies and plays and stuff. So let's go on and see where I caught myself. The, the uh... That, like they said, they asked me up in uh, uh, at Harvard, a bunch of kids asked me, what, what's comedy? So I said, and then this, this is part of what I'm trying to say about getting back from it. I, I said, comedy is tragedy plus time. Tra tragedy plus time. See tragedy plus time, okay? Now, when I practice my speech, which I do often, because someday I'm going to be giving it often, or a version of it. I, I invariably, it's not written into it, but I ad-lib it. When I call what I'm talking about, this light pumping thing, energy density plus time, I have to act to ham it up. Plus time. I'm as bad as this guy. Saying plus, com comedy is tragedy plus time. Probably says it ten times a day to everyone he meets. And thinks it's, you know, original, even though he copied it from somebody, but, you know, he wants to be seen as uh, clever or something. Even though everyone already thinks he is. So he's a blowhard. So, that's where I caught myself saying other people are blowhards for repeating that. But here I am saying energy density plus time, which is what it is. Radiant flux which includes time, and all that is, radiant flux per mass density. How much light can you shoot through the lightest thing you can build around 
to make a spaceship or something, or a space station, and how fast can you do it? That's a simple concept to a lot of people like me. Well, like everybody. I have to pay, you have to know a little science to know what energy density is, and then think about it. And then you add time to it. And then you yell about it. So that was there for that reason. I forget. The, how do I end that? I don't know. But again, I put the scout mindset here, which I never heard of until yesterday. Uh, I never heard it put that way, but uh, I know what they mean. Scout or soldier. Okay, if you're a scout, I suppose, in the military, you got to go out and see what's uh, what's what. And you got to report the truth, not what you, what you don't go tell the general or whoever it is. Yeah, we well, can probably win this. You go tell them the truth that there's 10,000 Germans out there, whatever it is, and we only have 2,000. So, uh, oh yeah, I watched a movie last night, Cromwell, 1970. A couple of good old actors in it, and uh, a lot of battles. English Civil War, really interesting. Anyway, how they battle and how they used to. But you, the scout has to go tell the truth and have a, quote, motivation to see things as they are, not as one wishes them to be. So there are many people watching this that might want to see things as they are, which is not this nonsense. But unfortunately, I may have to suggest that you should see things for, what is it, as they are, not how you, how you want them to be. Light is the medium, that's the way it is. So, enough of that one couple of more random items here. Okay, this is just weekly stuff in the news here. Uh, I'm not a weekly guy. I wish I was. I could do this all the time, but I happen to catch some time and space here. And the current thing, which if I had a more regular show, I would be more current. Oh, what is it? It's about this, uh, and this is relevant, these drones and these UAP reports from the government and a bunch of nonsense. And my clever tweets about them saying, hey man, you better, uh, <clears throat> what do you want to do? Biden administration, you want to pretend that you have everything in hand or do you want to be blamed later for not co connecting the dots about glowing orbs hovering over Air Force bases. Because someday, somebody might have to answer for some questions. And I've given you a bunch of answers here that might be right. You might want to look into that and think seriously about it. But, you know, my self-serving, yeah. Yeah, I hope, it, I, hope, I hope that's not necessary in this case. But, uh, you know, if you're playing cutesy with this stuff, go, you know... I don't know if I'd recommend it. No, oh, yeah, here's what, uh, yeah. Oh, the Arrow Report, yeah. Yeah, this is a little cartoon I sent them uh, about uh, glowing orbs of cold light. Woo it's a cartoon drawing of what I've been trying to say here. And it's buoyancy, it's... Light matter equivalence, what is it? Uh, mass light equivalence, whatever the hell it is. Getting tired. And, um, you know, that's what this stuff could be that you're not looking at. And speaking of that, here's my friend Joshua Bertrand, is uh, Bertrand probably. <clears throat> His Twitter account is linked below, and he's up to date on how this stuff, these um, lighter than air, but not, not like I'm saying. He's talking about current technology, which could exist, which could float a thing over a, an Air Force base. 
and these people were pretending to not see it or not report on it or something's wrong. There's a disconnect between what we know we can... I'm saying I, I'm speculating a little bit. I'm on the cutting edge. He's deep into what is real now but not seen. All right? Which is vacuum airships, aerogels, uh, airships... I mean, you could load a balloon with anthrax and fly it over the Pentagon and probably see it. But if you're having to move uh, entire Air Force wings, there's something missing there. Okay, if the orbs are flying over there, or the drones, you know. I think if you look up the definition of the word drone, it might include bees, too. So, uh... Let's not pretend that these are these quadcopters and things like that and, you know, airplanes we used to fly in the 60s. Radio-controlled airplanes and that kind of stuff. These could be highly advanced uh, vacuum airships or something. So, I hate to say I told you so now, but me and him have been telling you so stuff here, so... That's his shout out. And, um, well, I've said it before. I was in the first World Trade Center bombing in that building every day up until a few uh, months before this one. And I told that story, so I don't think I'm going to tell it again now. But you don't want to be surprised by mundane stuff. And is it worth it to play cutesy about it? Yeah, I don't know. Well, you'll find out. Probably the hard way. Like a lot of things these days. So, I think we end up on the MH370 case. Now, most of you know what this is and may or may not have strong feelings about it. Um, I think it's interesting and worth pursuing and all that stuff. I've already said what it, you know, my version of what it might be, if it's aliens or advanced technology or something, what could they possibly be doing? And I would say they're wrapping a slippery light bubble of cold light around this thing. In and out, up and down, in, through, out, and around. Well, in this case, around. But if you spew enough light out there so they're pushing all the air away and you're controlling that situation completely, would the thing pop? Look, it popped. Into a cold light, uh, you know. A, in other words, if you wrapped it, tied it, in a nice little bow. Let's look at it again. It's not that long. And uh, took the cheese when the time is right and the whole thing's just buoyant. It would become so buoyant it would. It could. And it, this is theoretical even for my stuff. Because I think in terms of the orbs controlling themselves. To me, that's like a bus going by almost at this point. Orbs flying around with no visible means and cold light and auras and ooh, G-forces and all that. Okay, you know, I know I'm in 2024. But, uh, yeah, no. Some, if not a lot of you watching this, are not. And I may be long gone. And I'm telling you... Yeah, I saw this on Ashton Forbes. He, Forbes uh, the primary, uh, the leading proponent and advocate of this mystery. He doesn't say what it is. All he has is questions, and he has a lot of them. And they're very well ordered and organized and thought out. And, um, <clears throat> well, I saw this little uh, AI thing he did. And uh, it just reminded me 
of what I thought about this thing and what it might be. And this is a little, you know, AI drawing of of the orbs going around the thing. Now, what would this be, in my opinion? Possibly. If I'm asked to solve this by President Bill Paxton. Yeah, something like that. Well, it could be. Uh, those things wrapped a cold bubble around it, and it popped out of space. And what I like about this drawing is how it looks like, see how there's a barrier there that's coming out of. To me, that looks like the atmosphere of Earth. You're at the end of the gas. And now you're out into space. And hopefully you land on a nice warm spaceship somewhere. And someday they take you home with E.T. and everyone else. And the, the pilots from 1942. I have no idea. But it's fun to watch. And when I saw that, it reminded me of what? Where are my reminders of what it reminds me of? Where is it? Oh, boy, don't tell me I forgot that. Move those over here. Ah, it's got to be right here. Uh, allow me to um ah for a second here. Yeah, it looks like I did forget... Oh, I put it here in the form of a tweet. It's probably right here. Yeah, I know it is, because I answered him. Here it is. Now, what does that, in my mind, imaginary light bubble popping a thing, easy enough to pop yourself out of the atmosphere. That, I can see that in a tic-tac. That's tic-tac 101, okay? That glib enough for you? But how do you move another thing that doesn't control its own light? Can you create an area, I think you can, that spoiler, of diminished gravity? There's no air in there. There's just light messing with the gravity all around this thing. The people in there have their own air, at least for a couple of minutes. And um, so you wrap this thing up in it. You, put, you go to it, wrap the thing around it, and say, okay, we're going to put an area of no gravity here, basically. What would happen? Well, it might pop out of the atmosphere. <clears throat> but don't take my word for it, because it will look something like this. <laughs> Can you believe the athleticism? Or it might look like what I like to call the champ. He might be the same guy, I'm not sure. Come on, champ. Suborbital. Now you're going to say that's a stupid ball. That's a ball with air in it. That has nothing to do with any imaginary fake videos. <laughs> it might. The same general principle. Now it's wrapped up differently. It's different. I agree. It's a little stretch. It's going to require a little thought. Unless you've been into it for a long time and you see the same principle. One more time, at least. Careful. Watch.
Well, that's what they did with that plane. Maybe. They aired uh, right out of the damn stratosphere and the other spheres. So, I think on that, a uh, note of triumph from the champ. One more time. No sound. Poof! Boom! Yeah! All right. I think that's actually a sport somewhere. They actually have contests. So uh, I think that's a, we're winding down here. Yeah, we saw that. And uh, yeah, as far as uh, the light and matter interaction. Real world. Welcome to the real world, because that's not it. That's what you're dealing with. The real world is this angel is telling this guy, Hey, the real world is like this. A big thing full of light. And by the way, the earth goes around the sun. That, that other guy's right. Sign off on his paper. Okay? And that's why Copernicus wasn't harassed or burned at the stake or any of this crap these uh, secular um, blowhards will throw at you. Boo bait. So I think, I think we're almost at the end in the real world. That's a good movie. You should see that. Everyone should see that movie and spend lots of money on it because this is a movie... Uh, a review site as well. It's not just a, a tinfoil hat site. We removed. See, See that, that acting when he says, Welcome to the real world. To the real world. That's what you're going to have to deal with with this stuff here. You want to figure out what these are? You want to engineer them yourself? You want flying saucers and flying cars? Get that scout attitude and welcome yourself to the real world. Let's sign out now, shall we? Since we have that optimistic viewpoint of how we're going to engineer our way out of this using existing physics and the real world and understanding that light is the medium here and we're going to control gravity with light matter interaction in a gravitational field. Let's go out on a negative note with our final blessing and benediction. From my uh, contacts and so on, uh, I, I think although there will be enough information coming out to finally lay to rest, that this is not a tinfoil hat subject and there's reality to it and uh, <clears throat> the government is making a concerted effort to to uh, learn more about it um, <clears throat> i think any truly deep state increase knowledge is likely not to come out i don't see all the barriers falling understand that's why it's on us folks sadly it's been left to a guy yelling into a microphone i think it's been three hours it seems like it and uh, anyway thanks for listening i don't think i can think of anything else uh right now hot jupiters <laughs> hot the so, since we can't play Hot, Hot, Hot by Buster Poindexter, we're going to play the music we can play and do our outro. But first, we go over to the other screen that you can't see. We increase our size here. Oops, wrong one. Increase. Me only. 
And I say goodbye and wave goodbye. Till next time. Hot Jupiters! Uh, yeah. Hold on for some music. Three hours and 20 minutes. Wow. Okay, music. And bye-bye. I mean it this time. Control pause.